Robert Rantel, uh, who is a writer, researcher, and did research for David Lipton's book, Best Evidence, has something to say about those premonitions of death that Kennedy might have nursed. Yeah, indeed, uh, the notion of a possible assassination was, you know, intermittently on President Kennedy's mind. It shows up in his uh, conversations and probably the political turning point of his administration and the, uh, the thing that kind of turned the tide and defined the last year of his, uh, his presidency uh, was the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, when he came into office, there were plans in operation to invade Cuba, which resulted in the Bay of Pigs, and uh, in the uh, year after that, uh, the presence of Soviet missiles uh, in Cuba led to tremendous lobbying on the part of uh, Cuban exiles, uh, the intelligence community, and the military in this country to take strong action to uh, rid the, the Cuba of the missiles and Cuba of Castro and uh, you know various operations by the CIA and uh, other, other groups uh, were aimed at uh, uh, doing battle with Cuba in a secret war. That led to the, uh, to the missile crisis um, at the time of the missile crisis, uh, the National Security Council uh, voted uh, in favor of the first strike against the Soviet Union. Uh, tensions were high, and there was a tremendous uh, pressure on the president to, uh, to uh, take warlike action. Uh, but Kennedy did uh, stand his ground against our own military, and uh, uh, although, you know, taking terrible risk facing Khrushchev, did eventually reach an accommodation uh, the bargain being the, re the uh, Soviet uh, removal of the missiles in exchange for a pledge by the Kennedy administration not to invade Cuba. And this was the uh, great betrayal that uh, Cuban exiles uh, speak of to this day, that uh, they felt that uh, that, that was uh, the ultimate uh, uh, sellout. Yeah, sellout to, uh, to uh, Caribbean communism. After, after uh, facing off the missile crisis, after making that non-invasion pledge, uh, Kennedy remarked to uh, one of his aides, you know, this would be a good night for going to the theater like Abraham Lincoln. He, uh, he realized, you know, that uh, the antagonisms towards him within his own country were maybe as great as the antagonisms that he was he was feeling from from uh, Cuba. Uh, I'm, just sure. to tell another short story on on the day of the assassination, uh, Daniel Moynihan, who was uh, he's now the uh, senator from New York. At that time, he was uh, an assistant secretary of labor in the uh, Kennedy uh, mm -hmm. cabinet. Uh, he heard the news uh, that the president had been shot and uh, was in Washington and rushed to the White House and monitored events uh, from there. When uh, Moynihan heard that a, a young leftist had been held and was being accused of the crime, uh, was probably a loner, the thought occurred to Moynihan that the most important thing to do at that moment was to get this man, Lee Harvey Oswald, out of the custody of the Dallas police and into the hands of federal marshals. And the reason he said that, that had to be done was to keep him from being killed while he was in Dallas. He tried uh, all afternoon to reach the Attorney General Robert Kennedy in order to, you know, to make this point and to insist that Oswald's safety be assured. But of course, he couldn't get through. Um, at the time of the assassination, most of the cabinet was on a plane bound for uh, Japan. The plane landed in Hawaii and returned to, to, uh, to the. Uh, to the Capitol. Moynihan went out to uh, the airport and worked his way down the line, starting with Secretary of State uh, and anyone else who would listen to him. And uh, then on Sunday morning, of course, that's exactly what happened. And uh, Moynihan, you know, helpless in the situation, just watched it go on. He then uh, tried to. Uh, get President Johnson to uh, run a full and complete investigation. He said it can't be a cover-up, it can't be the, the kind of thing that's going to just lay to rest the rumors, or else we're going to be living with this question for 20 years. And that's exactly, uh, that's exactly what Johnson didn't do, and that's exactly the kind of questions we've been living with. He said that he realized why no one would listen to him. He said that his problem was he was talking to educated people. And educated people all know that terrible things like assassination conspiracies don't happen. He said, but ordinary people do know that awful things do happen. They feel it in their gut, don't they? Yeah, they, even at, you know, in the early days, uh, Gallup kind of showed that, uh, by and large, people suspected there was more to this. And, uh, and as, as the years have gone on and more and more information has developed, uh, more and more people have come to that feeling. Well, you know, we talked a little about the Cuban connection. Uh, it's, it's interesting that in, in uh, Weisberg's book, Oswald in New Orleans, he quotes Castro as uh, giving a rather lengthy speech as he is wont to do. Um, and he also uh, 
Well, let's let's quote from it here. It's credible. Um, the, the pertinent speech, the one that is not in evidence, the, evidently the commission does not use the one that Weisberg feels is relevant, the Castro speech that Weisberg, uh, Weisberg feels is relevant. Um, the pertinent speech, which is not in evidence, does come through to me through the official United States Monitoring and Translation Service. It is an unofficial translation. It is speech on the assassination, in which he explains as he saw it what was involved, who he thought might benefit from the result and change the consequences might follow. It is a speech that is not unsympathetic to the late president. It would keep in radio and television. The Kennedy speech to which he refers was made on November 18th. Castro's speeches are long. I have exerting attacks on editors and journalists whom he names and abbreviating the rest. This is Fidel Castro talking about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, and I quote, These events occur precisely at a moment when Kennedy was being severely attacked by those who considered his Cuban policy. It could not be us, but only the enemies of the revolutionary general of a more moderate policy, a less warlike policy. The enemy of a policy like this who might be interested in the death of President Kennedy the only ones who perhaps could have received the news of Kennedy's death with satisfaction. A few days ago, an incident drew my attention. This was while the Inter-American Press Association conference was taking place. It was a scandal. They made long tirades against the speech delivered by Kennedy in Florida, which disappointed a number of persons who favor more aggressive policies toward Cuba. It was a disappointing speech for the counter-revolutionary elements. It was disappointing for the warmongering elements in the United States. And so a series of cables here. Miami, Florida. The Cuban exiles waited tonight in vain for a firm promise from President Kennedy to take energetic measures against the communist regime of Fidel Castro. A series of cables began to arrive. New York, November 20th, UPI. The Daily News editorial stated, Kennedy now refuses to allow Cuban exiles to launch attacks against Cuba from U.S. territory. The paper said, in fact, uses U.S. naval and air power to maintain Castro in power. And then finally, there was something very interesting, really very interesting and curious, which draws my attention when I read it. This is why I remember it and look for it in the papers. It says the third editor to express his opinion was Sergio Carbo. Carbo is directive of counsel of the Inter-American Press Association, an important post in intellectual circles. His statement ends, and this is what drew my attention by saying, quote, I believe that a coming serious event will Washington to change its policy of peaceful coexistence. In the words of Fidel Castro at the time after the assassination, what does this mean? What does this gentleman mean when he says, three days before the assassination, in a cable from Associated Press, 19th, AP number 254, Miami Beach, I believe that a coming serious event will oblige Washington to see a peaceful coexistence. What does this mean? Three days been Kennedy. Because when I read this, my attention, it intrigued me. It, was there perhaps some sort of under, perhaps some sort of plot? Was there perhaps in those reactionary circles where the so-called weak policy of Kennedy towards Cuba was under attack, where the policy of civil rights was under attack? Was there perhaps in certain civilian and military ultra-reactionary circles in the United States a plot against President Kennedy's life? We'll talk about this and other plots after these messages. Okay, we're talking about people that may have been drunk with power in terms of trying to determine the course of this country and assassinating President Kennedy. And uh, we've got a couple of uh, phone calls before we get back to uh, various theories that have been expanded. Line two, you're on the air with Robert Ramtel and Jay Davis. This is Noah Griffin. Good morning. Is that me? Yes, sir. Oh, great. Um, I read a book which was, to me, about one of the few I read, or the only one, actually, by, uh, I think it was O'Brien, the police chief of Los Angeles, who seemed pretty uh, authentic and didn't have any axe to grind or anything. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the book. I think it was called Appointment in Dallas. I've never heard anybody say anything about it, so I imagine it was kind of uh, uh, dis discharged as meaningless. But he talked about a paid political assassin who uh, he met later. He claims he met him. Yeah, Mc McDonald uh, is, is the author's name. Oh, right, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you comment on this book? And I've never heard anyone say anything positive or negative about it. Well, it, it's it was sort of a pot boiler he he brought out, uh, suggesting that he had met this uh, this figure who was who claimed to be the assassin, but he didn't really put forward any evidence, you know, besides his assertion that he had talked to this guy. Uh, he uh, he he claimed it's it's kind of complicated. There, the uh, CIA was taking photographs of people who uh, came in and out of the uh, embassies in Mexico City at the time when Oswald uh, visited. Uh, uh, the Cuban embassy and somehow 
uh, either by design or accident, a photograph uh, was passed around being recorded as being a photograph of Oswald entering the embassy, but it was obviously not Lee Harvey Oswald. It was a man uh, taller, fatter, older than Oswald. Now the question became, was that just a mistake? Uh, or did that man, that separate person, uh, actually pose as Oswald when he went into the embassy? They're, they're outside taking photographs, and if they know that the person who went in said he was Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, you know, that would be, a, you know, great grounds for, you know, for the, uh, someone posing as Oswald that, that we discussed earlier. Now, McDonald wrote a book saying that this man, who he called Saul, was in fact the assassin in, in Dealey Plaza uh, a few months after that. It seemed very plausible that this uh, assassin could have uh, gone up on the grass hill, done the job, and jumped in the airplane and been gone to Mexico by the time, uh, you know, Tippis was running around that theater. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, you know, McDonald was never forthcoming with any uh, evidence to back it up, other than his assertion that he had met with the guy and uh, they talked about the assassination. Yeah. Okay, well, good point. Okay. And I thank you so much for your call. What about it? D do you think that, uh, that Oswald did it or Oswald was involved? Jay, what do you think? My opinion is, <clears throat> my opinion is that I think Oswald might have known that something was going on. He might have known that there was assassination going on, or he might have been set up and sent in a direction that something else was going to go on, that he didn't do at least any of the shooting uh, of the assassination, and that he was set up. And that's... I first started looking into this just, you know, like I say, a face in the crowd, thinking... A conspiracy, Oswald in the school book depository, and somebody else somewhere else. And after looking at it, I don't think he did any of the shooting. Robert, what's your thick feeling about that? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still open to the possibility that Oswald was involved in the shooting. Uh, I, you know, I believe it was his rifle that was found in the book depository. Uh, you know, handwriting analysis on the. Uh, on the order forms for the rifle, uh, yeah, the, uh, the the palm print that was on the rifle, uh, the photograph of Oswald holding up a rifle very similar to the one, uh, I'll buy all that evidentiarily. Uh, um, you know, now that it's possible, of course, that that he was being played in a game and that he was being set up, uh, and at anywhere along that line, the setup, he, you know, his knowledge of the setup might have ended. Uh, maybe he was told to order a rifle and he never received it. Uh, maybe he was told to uh, uh, hold up a rifle for a photograph, and uh, maybe he was told to uh, bring a rifle to the book depository that day. Or maybe somewhere along the line it stopped. Maybe the photograph is a forgery. Maybe someone else had custody of the rifle and planted it there. But if you're going to postulate that, you've, you've got a lot of work ahead of you because you have to you know, find out who. Who was running Oswald? And uh, one of the important if Oswald wasn't uh, in the sixth floor window, the question then becomes, well, where was he? And uh, it seems important that if you were going to do a conspiracy and to set somebody up as a patsy, it's real important that that man not have an alibi at the time of the shooting. Well, he has a couple, okay? He says he was in the... He says, from his own words, that he was eating lunch uh, in the first floor there, at a, sipping a Coke and eating a sandwich, okay? Yet there's a picture of Oswald supposedly outside in what looks to me uh, as, in the same shirt that he was arrested in. And the it's another one of those fantastic coincidences, again, yeah. where you have a picture of this guy in the doorway... His shirt's open the same way. I mean, it's not like it's buttoned at the top and then he's arrested. It's, it's, it's the same thing. And as far as him saying he was in the lunchroom, um, unless I know otherwise, I guess in court you could say that that's hearsay evidence because no notes were taken during the interrogation. And that is, you look at, at the people who have shot at or have killed presidents. Every one of them has had a belief, either insane or, or sane, that they were willing to lay down their life for. And most of them, I would say all of them, were either glad they did it or they were very unhappy that the president lived and they were very unhappy that they missed. That's a pair that we can play of Oswald that doesn't fit that pattern, which is very strange because in Jim Bishop's book he says, Oswald uh, drew a beat on the president and fired and he knew he was going to be famous, but he wasn't going to make it that easy to be caught. And then when he was caught, he didn't go, yeah, I did it, I'm glad. He says, no, I didn't do it. 
Did I shoot this president? Did you shoot the president? No, I didn't shoot anybody. No, sir. I'm just a patsy. Let's hear another one. Another cut. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. And the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reported it in the hall. Well, that's the only thing I've heard about it. The voice of Lee Harvey Oswald. Sound like somebody that uh, shot and killed the president. Every person that uh, shot and killed the president before when they take him into custody. I did it. I killed the right wing SOB. I killed the imperialist uh, son of a gun. Uh, I did it and I'm proud that I did it or I'm happy. I'm sorry they, I'm sorry that I missed. I'm sorry he didn't die. Does this sound like somebody that... Uh... And after 20 years you ask people what was the motivation. And there is, well, you know, there's this big hesitating thing because there isn't a clear cut and um, stuff about getting the rifle and uh, getting down into the lunchroom where he was floor in time after hiding the rifle in, in these boxes and uh, curtain rods and the fact that the bag that he rifle in showed no creases on the bag from the rifle, showed no oil stains. They said they lifted two off the bag that were Oswald's and yet they didn't lift any other fingerprints of like the police who handled it. Uh, there's just all these all these things that if you were going to convict them I think it would be on circumstantial evidence that Winnie clear cut 100% we got him type of thing. I believe a test was uh, performed to see if he had fired a firearm that day. I think it was negative. Well, uh, no, the test was, was positive on, uh, on his hands uh, but uh, there, were, there were no traces on his cheeks so it... it it didn't. It didn't rule out the possibility that he had fired a rifle, but neither did it confirm hey, absolutely. What I think we'll do is we take a few phone calls, just kind of recreate the scene for that day, and then and just you know why maybe just briefly why Kennedy came to came to uh, to, to Dallas. Uh, what was the route of the motorcade? Uh, when the shots rang out? What happened after that? And then maybe we'll get into some of this. Where you think Oswald did it, and maybe why you think he may not have done it, Robert? Why don't we take a couple phone calls here? Line one, uh, San Francisco. Uh, Noah Griffin, here I came. Hello, Noah. This is Diane. Hi, Diane. How are you? Well, fine. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Pardon me, in the proper sense of the word. Um, I wondered if your guests had ever read an article by Richard E. Sprague, who uh, wrote this for Computers and Automation, May 1970. And he had a degree in 1942 of computer career and so on. I sent this Xerox to Bernard Finsterwald at the Committee for Investigation for Assassination several months ago, and it came back moving up no forward. But the part of the article that Sprague wrote that caught my attention, because it's more definitive than some of the others, is this. Uh, Oswald's message to the FBI. It says, among other evidence collected by Garrison and Mark Lane, and confirmed by Mark Lane, is the fact that Oswald telephoned the Dallas, Texas office of the FBI on November 20th and told them that President Kennedy was going to be assassinated on November 22. And the FBI teletype message was sent that day to Hoover with that information. A repeat teletype message with that information was also sent on that day to the New Orleans office of the FBI, apparently because of all Oswald's former presence there. And a clerk in the New Orleans office of the FBI revealed the existence of the teletype message and gave a deposition to that effect to Garrison. Yeah, uh, the, I mean, that's, that's a story that, that did go around. Uh, the teletype, though, has, has never been found, uh, nor has anyone who ever saw it, aside from Mr. Walter, the man who uh, said he did see it. Yeah. Uh, no, one has ever, no one has ever been able to confirm that such a thing was found. In fact, Walter also uh, gave statements to the FBI that, that uh, Lane was making that up, that uh, he knew nothing of that teletype. Well, uh, I've read about, I guess, nine books, and just by chance the other day found one titled Lee and Marina, I think is the name of it. I, what's her name? Priscilla... Priscilla McMillan. Well, yeah. when you get to the back, the references are really more uh, helpful than the text of the book. But some, a couple points, and then I'll let you discuss these. Uh, having read all the books that I've read, I'm 
very suspicious about Michael and Ruth Payne, and also this gentleman, Mr. Kristenick, if you're familiar with him, he worked with Michael Payne, and I think either the night of the assassination or the day before Ruby uh, killed Oswald, Kristenick went to Jack Ruby's restaurant and he didn't drink. Uh, in other words, it was a place to hook me out of uh, his normal environment. And the other thing that I think is interesting, you know, uh, not all the books carry this, but the, those that do uh, cite the fact that this Mr. What the devil was his name? Mr. Casper, I believe, that worked in the book depository as an official, he bought a Mauser and one other gun, I think it was Wednesday of that week, and he happened to be in Mr. Cooley's office, and Oswald was there. And Mauser was showing, or Mauser, Mr. Casper, rather, was showing Mr. Cooley the guns. And um, that intrigued me because it was a Mauser. And the other one, I can't remember. And that's the gun that they, the police department initially said that they had in their possession when they went to their sixth floor and, and, and searched it in Mauser 7.65. Yeah, and the other thing that I think is interesting is that initial rumor that was going around and Wade and Alexander came on a stat order to Washington, but it was because of the story going around that uh, Oswald was an FBI agent. But you can pursue that later. The last thing that I would mention that always has intrigued me is why Mr. Hosty destroyed that note. But if it was really a threatening note of Oswald saying if you don't knock off harassing my wife and going to blow the place up, why would they tear that note up? I mean, if anything, they would use that to, you know, to incriminate him beyond what he's already done. So it seemed to me that there must have, must have been some evidence of, uh, of the fact that they didn't wish to vote, so that Hosty was advised to destroy that note. But Samuel would have been one that saw it. Good point, I am. Yeah. Jay, did you want to... Uh, I'm probably just going to say that... Um you know, one possible reason for destroying the note is, uh, from what I understand, and Robert can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, I guess it was Hosty or Hoisty didn't uh, let the Secret Service know about Oswald because it was uh, believed that he knew the, the route of the parade, the motorcade, and that he knew it would go uh, past the school book depository and that he knew Oswald worked there. So, of course, if this was just a slip of the memory, then indeed you'd want to destroy the note and uh well, of those memory, huh? yeah if, if you would want to destroy the note and say uh well i don't i never heard of him or something like that because it was quite a few years i think well, wait, by that time because he, he was down there at the police station within an hour and a half mm -hmm. and as i said all the evidence or the evidence the connections of ruth Payne and, and michael Payne being so uh concerned quote unquote about oswald and marina having their battles and taking them in and and subsidizing her life uh, because oswald couldn't pay them quote unquote he probably had a shortage of money but if you ever you know delve into it it certainly seems to me that ruth and michael Payne are two people that i would if i were a detective i'd be very suspicious of and chris and nick as i said in one book and i wish i could tell you which of the last ones i've got so darn many but he the four of them, he and his wife and Michael and Ruth Payne went out either that night or Saturday night, had dinner, and suddenly Chris and Nick decides to go to Jack Ruby's restaurant. And the next day we know what happens as far as Ruby is concerned. But I I think I agree with whichever of you gentlemen indicated that uh, you don't think that Oswald uh, did it overtly. If, if anything, it seems to me he would have been the patsy, as he says on uh, your tape and all the other uh, times that it's been said. We'll, we'll play that again for the benefit of those people that didn't get a chance to hear it. Yeah. Well, I, I could give it, if, if you wanted this study article, as I said, it's Computers and Automation, May 1970. And there's, I think he's itemized 2,500 photographs. They're not all, you know, in this article, but he's got them on computers someplace, taken by all these di uh, different people. And I know there's one book that's a paperback, I don't know if you've read it, Conspiracy in Dallas. Have you read that? Oh, uh, gosh, we've got so many books here now. Conspiracy in Dallas? Yeah, it's uh, 1981 by Wayne Fairchild. And you can order it from Box 448, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71161. Well, it's kind of a running, you know, by date things, but the, in the beginning of it, um, I wish I could tell you the name, 
happened, but there was a guy, and I think his last name was Gonzalez. He was over there on the grassy knoll, and he was also involved with some other Cubans, and they got the hell out of there very fast, and the sheriff's office knew about it very, very shortly, and I think they were the ones that got on a plane in Mexico. They held up the plane for quite a few hours until they got on, and they flew with the pilot and got got gone real quick. Anyway, I wouldn't buy everything that's in this book, but I, as I said, from the number of books, 11 or whatever it is now that I've read, I, I don't think Oswald was uh, uh, the one that did it. And I, again, I would emphasize anybody that's interested, myself being one of a group, uh, that Michael and Ruth Payne and their contacts, all of whom were Russian, uh, white Russian, taking uh, Great. Thanks so much, Diane. Hi. Okay, good to hear from you again. Let's go to line three. Noah Griffin here on KGO with our guests. Good morning. Hello? Yes. Um, I want to tell you about a phone call that came in uh, here in Oxnard on the day of the assassination predicting his uh, murder. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I remember when it happened very clearly uh, when the paper came out. Of course, we were all stunned having heard the news on television. So when the paper came out, we were stunned to see that uh, the Oxnard uh, uh, Exchange had received a call. And uh, we all waited. They said it was turned over to the FBI. And we all waited. I scanned the papers every day and nothing more happened. And so on the 10-year retrospective, uh, our senior editor of our paper here in Ventura County, may I just read you a few paragraphs? Because sure, his by all means. Go right ahead. It more clearly. Um, Point McGill, you know, this isn't his words. Point McGill is the place where now Reagan comes in and then is helicoptered to Santa Barbara. And Kennedy had been there on June 7th, 1963. Well, anyway, I'll tell you what the uh, senior editor says. There is one haunting local incident regarding President Kennedy's assassination that has never been explained and presumably never will be. This was a telephone call that General Telephone Company operators in Oxnard got from a whispering woman predicting that the president would be killed. The woman first came on the phone about 10.05 a.m. while Friday and whispered to the operator that the president will be shot at 10 minutes after 10. Then minutes later, the same voice called back to say, it won't be 10 after 10, it will be 10.30. The hour of 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time was 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas. And history records that it was at 12.30 that the shots rang out from the Texas Book Repository in the President's Hospital's car. Rest the Parkland Hospital, he was pronounced dead a half hour later. Ray Sheehan, Oxnard Division, Division Manager of the phone company, told the Starfleet and Press at the time that the call came to the office switchboard in the regular way. One of the supervisors could not make out what the woman was saying, so she summoned the second. The whisper was so faint, the supervisor thought maybe the woman was ill or that some emergency was involved. She and said there was no undue concern about the warning because the phone company gets a lot of prank calls. He said the call apparently came from the Oxnard, Port Wayne, or Point Magoo area, the regular service area of the Oxnard Exchange. It could not be traced, or at least was not. When the reality of the prediction became known, the FBI was called. Okay, that's the end of that. And as I say, we waited for days asked for the FBI to report something, and they never did. But can I also read you then when these new hearings were going to come up in 19... Oh, I don't know. My letter, anyway, is 1975. Sure, if you could speak more directly into the mic and a little more volume. Oh, yes. Great. Um, or into your receiver, rather. I decided to get in touch with my congressman because he was one of the sponsors of the last hearings. So he, uh, I got a letter then from the United States Department of Justice, the FBI. And may I just read you what they say? Yes, go right ahead. Okay. This will acknowledge, let's see, receipt of your letters and so forth concerning a telephone call your office received. Read a while. Let me get to the main part of it. Okay, the unidentified caller allegedly made statements that President John F. Kennedy would be killed on that day. An investigation was conducted regarding these calls in November 1963. It was determined that the telephone company personnel
well in Oxnard, serviced approximately 12,000 telephones in that area, of which, of which 60% were party lines. The telephone company advised that they were unable to identify the caller or location from which the calls originated. The telephone company personnel who listened to the calls advised that it was their impression that the caller was quite mentally disturbed. The United States Secret Service was notified of the call. The FBI was not notified regarding this matter until 11.35 a.m. That was our time. You know, Dallas had already was, what, 1.35 anyway. The California time, which was after the assassination had taken place, a thorough investigation of the assassination has failed to indicate any possible connection between the above-mentioned phone calls and the assassination itself. <laughs> Can you yeah. imagine they, they stayed at the exact time, and yet the FBI and the Department of... It was, it's it's another one of those fantastic coincidences. If it's uh, that can be a coincidence. Well, I know, but that's, yeah, that's how it's always justified. I think is a fantastic coincidence. <laughs> yes, and he wrote about now the twentieth uh, retrospective. The same editor who is now retired uh, again mm -hmm. printed it because, as he said, he's just as uh, you know uh, puzzled as uh, anyone about it. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. We surely appreciate your phone calls. One more thing. Sure, go ahead. Uh, during the uh, hearings, or just before the hearings, who was rep Representative Thomas Downing, Virginia? Is he still there? No, he retired. Oh, well, he said at the time, and then I saw nothing more. I followed the hearings on television. Uh, he said at the time, uh, this was in July 31st, 76, in the paper, uh, Thomas Downing said Friday, promises Richard Nixon made to opponents of Fidel Castro may inadvertently have set in motion the events that led to the assassination of President Kennedy. Downing said he has obtained affidavits and transcripts suggesting this train of events. Um, a spokesman said the material, which Downing says is startling and disturbing, suggests Kennedy failed to carry out Nixon's promises, leading to the Bay of Pigs disaster in 61 and ultimately to his own death. We are in no way suggesting that Richard Nixon had any knowledge of any connection with President Kennedy's assassination. But uh, this information alleges that in planning the Bay of Pigs, his Nixon's association with the people involved was one of the factors that set in motion a chain of events that later would be involved in the assassination. Now, I heard nothing more of that after that. Did you during the hearing? He was going to make all this public, and then I heard nothing about it during the hearings. Did you? Well, uh... Only, only to the to the extent that the you know the committee did conclude uh, it may well have been people involved mm -hmm. in the Cuban political situation who had a hand in the. Uh, I realize because I followed you know, the Cuban connection. Uh, those mm -hmm. people in uh, Florida, um, who I really think linked directly to it myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you uh, what do you think of a woman calling and stating the exact time he would be killed? I think that's very strange. And, no. uh, and I remember the day it happened very clearly. You know, it was the day of the assassination. It is. It is a very, very, very chilling kind of, uh, kind of thought, even. And thank you so much for contributing that. Pure Radio News Talk Time is 3.46. We're here with Jay Davis and Robert Grant Patel. Uh, uh, Robert, what to... Kennedy was in Dallas to do some fence mending politically, wasn't he, uh, that fateful day? Yeah, yeah, political infighting. Texas State Democratic Party had, had reached a point where it was felt that uh, the president should make a visit uh, both to raise funds and mend those fences uh, in squabbles between uh, uh, Senator Yarborough and uh, uh, the, uh, the other faction of the Democratic Party in Texas, uh, uh, of which Lyndon Johnson and John Connolly were part. Um, the, the relations between uh, Kennedy and the, and the Texas Democrats uh, were never good. Uh, relations uh, between uh, 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 Texans and, and liberals uh, at that time were, were terrible. Uh, Adlai Stevenson had, had encountered uh, violent uh, protests uh, when he was in Texas just a few weeks before. And uh, there was considerable you know, trepidation on the part of Kennedy people for, for him to go into such a hostile situation. Um, it's been said that the primary reason he went there was to go to a uh, benefit dinner for Congressman Al Thomas, which had been held the night before the uh, Dallas motorcade. And uh, 
uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the visit was set up uh, by Governor Connolly uh, and uh, the, the uh, help of Lyndon Johnson uh, around uh, the fundraising dinners and the benefit for... According to the Free Press, uh, the Front's the L.A. Free Press this year, that uh, the route was chosen by Connolly's cronies. Well, the route the, of the never satisfied with the... Uh, with the uh, the investigation the committee did in the uh, in the planning of the parade route, because that seems like an, an essential thing that would be studied if if one were going to ability of a of a conspiracy, and uh, how it happened that uh, you know that the turns were made uh, from a, from a security standpoint, the small uh, sure. the, the motorcade was going too slow. Uh, Secret Service agents had proper uh, arrangements for security. Uh, well, they got around and got drunk the night before. Did they? There there are reports and. Uh, uh, help from other agencies such as uh, army intelligence uh, which uh, traditionally had been used in presidential visits to other cities uh, did not go go uh, on the Dallas on the Dallas visit um, didn't the chief of security or some didn't the chief of security or uh, some big head guy like that stay back in Washington instead of uh uh, uh, coming uh, with the motor. Yes, yes, Secret Service official Gerald Ben uh, normally would accompany the uh, the president on these trips, but he hadn't made this one, and uh, so it, so things were kind of were, were quite chaotic uh, when the assassination did take place, and and it led to uh, you know all sorts of problems in terms of. Uh, in that the uh, the presidential detail of Secret Service agents. Uh, at the moment that Kennedy was shot, well, the, their priority had to go to protecting the new president, then Lyndon Johnson, who uh, was lying on the floor of his car as the as they sped to the hospital. Well, the uh, let's see what happens. Kennedy Kennedy lands at Love Field, and there are beautiful photographs of that because there was a, a government uh, official government film being made of this, and and makes a speech uh, that morning, and uh, then. Uh, is, 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 as the scheduling takes place, uh, goes on a fateful uh, motorcade. Then, then what happens? Well, heading heading towards a, a speech at the uh, at the Dallas uh, Trade, Trade Mart. Yeah, uh, one of the things with which, uh, once again, after years of, of dogged research, uh, a newspaper reporter in Texas was able to do was to locate uh, a figure who's been known as the Umbrella Man, a source of fascination for years and years. In this. Uh, as the president rides through Sunny Dealey C at just about the point on the street where the shots are fired, a man umbrella aloft, an open uh, umbrella, and moving it up and down. And, and for years and years, people were wondering what that man was doing there. And the uh, wackier conspiracy theorists have suggested he was even firing uh, umbrella and, and things like that. And uh, the investigation, uh, the man was finally located. And... and, and uh, he he was brought to Washington, testified before they complained it like this. He said that he had heard that the umbrella was kind of a sore point with the Kennedys. And it all goes back to the politics of, of John's father, Joseph, who was ambassador to England at the time of the Munich Pact, when Neville Chamberlain... Uh, 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 Made his made his uh, appeasement accommodations with Adolf Hitler, and uh, earned the enmity both Chamberlain and Joseph Kennedy of uh, large segments of, of the Democratic Party in America. Uh, Kennedy was later recalled by Trump and and political aspirations of Joe Kennedy came to an end. Uh, and Dr. Trump was over and a lot of that hatred for Joseph Kennedy carried on to uh, to John Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson used to refer to John Kennedy as uh, Sonny Boy. And during the uh, during the primaries in 1960, when Johnson ran against Kennedy for the Democratic nomination, he uh, stood before caucus meetings and said. Uh, I was never any Chamberlain umbrella policy man. I never liked Hitler, uh, suggesting that, in fact, uh, that Kennedy, John, as his father, would be on the side of a sort of wonderful symbology at the moment when uh, when uh, John Kennedy was being assassinated. Here was uh, this bizarre occurrence of an individual standing there with an umbrella as, as kind of a, re you know, hearkening back to, uh, to that... Uh, 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 enmity towards the Kennedys that uh, establishment p politicians in this country had. Uh
And then another theory was that he was the he was the marker because there were two or three assassins that they were to wait till the car got to that point because uh, in the film or in photos it showed that the gunshots started right when they got to that point. So it was theorized that he was he was the marker because there was a uh, configuration of assassins. Twenty years later, what's so remarkable to me is taking a look at your Life magazine, Jay, the show pictures at the time immediately, instantaneously, without any reflection or thought. People start running towards that grassy knoll. The two policemen get off with their bubble helmets on, off their motorcycles, and start running in that direction. Now, I'm not quite sure what happened then, whether or not the person that they accosted or persons were actually on the grassy knoll or in the parking lot behind when they said, Secret Service, supposedly the officer drew a pistol, drew a beat, who are you, what are you doing here? And the person went for their wallet, reached or reached for the secretary, and opened up and said, Secret Service, either we've got this area covered, or Secret Service, you're doing a good job. And sorry, sorry, sir, the officer put his pistol back in his holster and went on and did something else. What is your uh, recollection, or what do you, uh, what have you researched what happened? Uh, were the people on the knoll itself, or were they back in the parking lot, or... They, they, the, that person was indeed on the grassy knoll and did did identify himself by all accounts as, as Secret Service. Yet Secret Service says there's no one stationed there. And Secret Service had no agents in Dealey Plaza on the ground that they all accompanied the motorcade to the hospital. And uh, the it was searched out at the time uh, uh, of the assassination. And again, the House Assassinations Committee tried to find out who that could possibly have been. And no satisfactory answer has ever been found. It's been suggested it could have been uh, an Army intelligence agent or an alcohol, tobacco, and firearms agent. But why they would identify themselves as Secret Service, you know, remains a mystery. And there was uh, supposedly somebody stationed on the overpass who, out of the corner of his eye, saw uh, an official-looking car drive up to the parking lot behind the grassy knoll, saw a gentleman, some, somebody get out, and people drive away, and he was going to testify, allegedly, and was one of the 17 people, material witnesses, who who had the grassy knoll theory, who were either killed or died of heart attacks or had their throat slashed or natural circumstances over the next three years, which in the London actuary says the chances of that happening are 100, 100,000 trillion to one. I'm, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a, a skeptic on the mysterious uh, death uh, statistics. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that the House Committee did was they corrected that odds report and, right. and showed that uh, you know the 100,000 trillion to one figure is uh, is a misapplication of statistics uh, that in, indeed you know people who could have been material witnesses had the case ever come to trial did die um, but uh, you know the temptation to connect that up to something they knew about the assassination uh, I think is one that you have to hold back on because it's since the case deaths, weren't there? Yeah, I was well, there, say, there's there a lot some. of bumbling, uh, yeah. crime-ridden people. Too. Yeah, I mean, there's a, uh, well, yeah, and, and, but some of those people, uh, not only were their deaths not mysterious, uh, they're not even dead. Uh, Warren Reynolds, for instance, is is, off, is the man who's on that list, and uh, he's, uh, as far as I know, still alive. Uh, did he address no fear? Uh, no, he was he's a witness at the uh, Tippett shooting. Um, another person. Uh, uh, and I forget whether it's Domingo or Eddie, uh, another witness. Uh, uh, he was not killed, but his brother was killed, so his name was slapped onto the list to uh, suggesting that the conspirators, you know, inadvertently killed someone's brother. Another another stripper who knew Jack Ruby uh, was listed on that list a long time ago. And she, okay, we're uh, we're going to get back into this. We're going to take your phone calls. We're also going to be talking with Harold Weisberg and Frederick Maryland uh, in the next hour. Uh, so. Good morning and welcome back to the program. And Noah Griffin here. Uh, we're talking about the Kennedy assassination and JFK, John F. Kennedy assassination, and the subsequent investigations, the various theories. We're here with some buffs and experts. Uh, we talked with Paul Hoke the first couple of hours, who was a citizen researcher, uh, who uh, we did a phone interview with, conference call. We're here in studio with Jay Davis, a buff on this, and an expert, uh, Robert Ramfatel, a writer researcher, uh, did a great deal of research for David uh, Lifton's book. The best evidence, uh, and uh, what we're going to be doing this hour, we're attempting to set up a, uh, a phono uh, with Harold Weisberg, who uh, you know is the author of Whitewash uh, 1 through 4. Uh, Whitewash 1 just deals with the Warren Commission in general. Uh, then there's photographic uh, Whitewash suppressed Kennedy assassination pictures. Whitewash 4. Uh, uh, JFK assassination transcript, um, 
author of uh, Postmortem uh, and uh, and a lot of other uh, research on uh, on the Kennedy assassination. Harold, are you with us? Yes, indeed. Good morning, and welcome to the program. Glad to be back there again. It's been years. Well, it's good to have you uh, on the air. You're you're here with Robert Ramfetel, whom I'm sure you know. Uh, yes, I know him. We've never met. Right. And uh, Jay Davis, uh, who's, who's quite a buff uh, on on the whole assassination. Um, why don't we, I, you know, with somebody like you who's, ri- who's written so extensively on this, it's very difficult to know even uh, where to begin. Why don't we Why don't we begin at the conclusion and then work our way back through 20 years of having uh, researched this thing and written as extensively, certainly, and exhaustively as anybody on the subject. What theories are you comfortable with as to who actually shot? Is that right? Not one. Uh, I'm in a minority position on this. I think the most difficult thing for people... ...difficult for people to understand that. But in the absence of an official investigation, uh, there is a limit to what private citizens can do. I think that there's something else I want to say on this point, however, and that is that the interest of those you refer to as books and those who have done scholarly work like Rand Kell, scholarly work like Rand mm-hmm. Kell, represent the working of the pure concept of American self-government, the participation of citizens. And without that, the people would never have had cause to have even doubts about the official account of the assassination of their president. Well, you, you allege a cover-up from the very beginning, from even the selection of members on the commission. Why don't we start there? The first thing I said was that it was a whitewash, Mm -hmm. uh, which is not quite the same thing. But uh, before any of the other books that followed mine were out, I was covering it, calling it a cover-up. And that's the subtitle of my second book, which came out at about the time Mark Lane's did. From the very beginning, let let me explain something. uh, My background is different than that of other people who work in the field. I'm a former reporter and investigative reporter. I was an intelligence analyst, but I was never a spook, although I was an investigator uh, in intelligence. So the first thing I did was to do what I had done as, uh, as a professional in intelligence, analyze. And I analyzed the Warren Report. And my first book, with the exception of the citation of one newspaper clipping, comes entirely from the Warren Commission evidence. It is an analysis of it. Yeah, you're you're trying to you're struggle to get that printed as a story in and of itself, and for the benefit of those listeners who might not know, why don't you share this? The fact that you you sent it to 63 houses that that uh, that turned it down essentially. That, what was more unusual than that is that I didn't get a single adverse editorial comment. The editors liked the book, and there were policy decisions against it. Uh, one publisher uh, who was who really had reason to fear the Department of Justice. Uh, actually tried to get another publisher to publish it. Uh, and I can tell you exactly what this official said. He said, with your background and our public relations know-how, this will be the Greenfelt Jungle of 1965. Greenfelt Jungle is the book that sold more copies in 1964 than any other book. And he said, uh, I want to help you. But he said, we're worried about the Department of Justice. He spelled out why, and it was quite legitimate. Uh, his, his company had published a fraudulent book. Uh, they didn't intend it. They didn't know they were publishing a fraudulent book, but nonetheless, they were guilty of fraud in the pavilion. The big shots didn't want to be indicted. It's, 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 you see, that's quite understandable. So he said, I'm going to call so-and-so. I can tell you the name if you want it, and I can tell you the publisher if you want it. Mm-hmm. He said, he's Eisenhower's editor and Nixon's editor, and I'm going to ask him to read this book. I want him to publish it. And in my presence, he did. And I got a reply from that publisher one week later, in which they said, our decision was not editorial and not easy to arrive at. Perhaps if you had gone farther afield, we would have been more tempted. In short, they couldn't apologize for the book, uh, and they were they too were afraid of the government. And that is the essence of it, uh, one way or another, that people just weren't that, some people weren't, most people just weren't that honest. The amazing thing is that after I, uh, some people have said I invented the underground book, I don't know if that's true or not, but after I went and did and brought the book out, published it myself in 1966, when I was at the uh, annual convention of the American Booksellers Association, one publisher after another who had turned the book down came up to me and, and uh, praised me for my courage in doing what I had done. 
commentary of American publishing. Harold, uh, this is Robert Raftow. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to you after, uh, I mean, I've spent years reading FBI files, which, uh, many of which through your dogged uh, determination have finally been uh, released to the public. Well, uh, you give people an idea how many books? Well, there, there's uh, more than 100,000 pages. Uh, there's more than 300,000. That's, that's, <laughs> wow. that's more. Uh, when you say that you're not happy with any uh, official government investigation, do you include the House Committee in that? Uh, how did you feel ultimately about uh, their work? Definitely. I think that perhaps uh, the ethics and morality were lowest with the House Committee. It never intended to investigate the crime. You had this strange man, Robert Blakey, who came to dominate it. And he began with his own hang-up. He got a hang-up on the mob. Uh, and he intended only what I'm afraid you younger people didn't appreciate. Because, you know, one of the, the only advantages of years is that, and I have accumulated more than 70, uh, is that you look back uh, very often on mistakes and profit, benefit, learn from them. Blakey never investigated, intended that committee to investigate the crime. Now, you, you were quite familiar with those hearings, and I'd like you to think in terms now of what I'm going to perhaps suggest to you for the first time and see if you can't find that at least it is in accord with your observations. What Blakey actually converted that committee into doing was putting down all the critics and uh, what he expected to be the definitive thing, the police radio tape, the tape of the police radio broadcast, actually backfired. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he had a chance to save himself from bankruptcy. So all of a sudden, he came up with a conclusion that is disputed by every single thing he did in that committee's so-called investigation, the conclusion that there was a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the irony is, is not lost that uh, Mr. Blakey, who, is, who was an organized crime expert, takes a look at the Kennedy assassination and decides that it was an organized crime conspiracy. Uh, he decided that before he did any work. Yeah. Now, Mark Allen is conducting three of his information cases, which is Go right ahead, uh, Carol. Uh, you have a picture of the president's shirt collar. I do. Now, that picture did not reach the Warren Commission. I got it from Richard Kleindienst when he was reading from what doesn't happen very often. I got the summary judgment against the Department of Justice in another Freedom of Information case. And I had filed a request for, the, for some of the FBI's pictures that hadn't given to the Warren Commission. Kleindienst got up from the FBI as what is absolutely incredible. He sent me the originals, not copies. I mean, I have the FBI original pictures of that. Oh, my God. 
and that picture shows very clearly that it simply is not possible that a bullet caused the damage to the president's shirt collar. If you look at the picture, you hear your own description to the audience. The two slits do not coincide, yes. and they are not the same length. And they are on a different part of the collar. You're absolutely right. To the knot of the tie. Now, there's, uh, there's, for all the magic attributed to the bullet that's supposed to have done this, known as bullet 399, because that's the evidence number for the commission, there is no bullet, even in mythology, that can go through a, a neatly dressed president and make a, a slit instead of a hole a quarter or a half inch higher on one side of a shirt collar that is buttoned than on the other and have that uh, about three quarters of an inch away from where it's supposed to have nicked the knot of his tie. Now, Blinky knew all these things. Chris Town knew all these things. They got my books from me. I love the trouble getting paid. That's because they only had five million bucks. Uh, but uh, they knew this. Did they investigate it? Of course they didn't. Because if they had, Blakey would have been, the committee would have been in conflict with the FBI. And there aren't many people who are willing to do that. And that includes federal judges. I've been before enough of them to know. You know, I, I prove that the FBI lies on the road, which is a felony, and perjury. About if it's about what's, mat what's material, it's perjury. And you know what a judge says? I mean, he tells me in open court, you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Mm. And then on another occasion, the same judge says to me, says to my lawyer, you know, you and your client could be sued for saying such things. And my lawyer says, Your Honor, we're willing to walk outside the privilege of the protection of the court and say the same things. And the judge says, Really? My lawyer says, Yes. And the judge goes on to something else. Now, this is the reality. They're all afraid of the FBI. That included the Warren Commission, which spelled it out, the executive session transcripts. They never expected a devil-loving scripture ever to get them out. It's true of the courts. It's true of everything. Let me tell you, your audience, a story that I doubt they've heard about how the FBI defended itself when it was under attack by sandbagging the CIA. You may remember that there's a story, and this leads to one of the popular theories of conspiracy and the assassination of the president, that the CIA at one point got some mod figures, Momo Giancana and Johnny Rosselli, uh, to see if they couldn't arrange to get Castro knocked off. So, uh, and this, by the way, I want you to know this is not libelous, so you don't have to worry about any delays. It's all in the public domain. Uh, Momo was having a, an affair with one of the McGuire sisters, Phyllis McGuire, and he suspected she was going to bed with Dan Martin out in Vegas. So he leans on the CIA. You want me to work for you? You do something for me. I want you to uh, get this get this guy's bed wired, and I want to find out. So they did it. But it was an incompetent job. It was done. They hired an outside guy to do it, and he, he had the mic on the back of the bed, but it wasn't hidden, so a maid found it. Well, this led to quite a hassle. And the guy says, you don't need to talk? Get me out of it. Well, the FBI gets involved in all of this, and that was 1960, 1961, and they sit on it. They don't do a thing about it. But then in 1967, Jim Garrison starts making noises about the FBI. And Lyndon Johnson wants to know what's going on. So the FBI tells him that there was, and this, these, these are the words of Marvin Watson, who was one of the President Johnson's closest associates, uh, in a memorandum that I got at one of these lawsuits. Uh, and it was, the memorandum was written by Carter DeLoach, who was then the number three man in the FBI, who was in charge of its leaking and propaganda, and also lobbying. He was pretty good. He even had Jerry Ford as an FBI informal, and Jerry Ford was a member of the Warren Commission. And he, and he tells this story to J. Edgar Hoover in a memorandum that Marvin Watson and the president had been discussing the Kennedy assassination, and based on the information I've just described, 
that the FBI had given to the president. The president believed that there was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy and that the CIA was part of it. Well, of course, that turned Johnson off. He didn't want to find anything out more about what the government was doing. Now, they did that on all levels. In November 1966, when, uh, after my first book, several others, Mark Lane's was out, Epstein's was out, and a lot of attention on talk shows. And Lyndon Johnson wants to know something about what these books say. So he asked the FBI, what, what about these books? And the FBI files a reply that doesn't mention a thing about any of the books. It tries to assassinate the characters of all of the authors. Now I'll, tell you, now I'll tell you what they said about me. It took a little bit of effort to get it, but I got it. It said that my wife and I annually celebrated the Russian Revolution. <laughs> with a party for 30 to 35 unknown people at our home. Well, that floored me because in those days I had a small farm about 40 miles from Washington. And uh, I never had 40 people and 35 or 40 people in my home. The home wouldn't have held them. And I worked every day. You know, farmers have to work around the clock. My wife finally figured out what it was. We had a friend named Jack Frankel who was a rabbi with the Jewish Welfare Board in Washington. And uh, he is a character at Exodus. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, he's, he, uh, if, for those of you people who remember the story of the book, he is one of those who was on the airplanes that convinced the more backward Jews in Yemen that the airplane was the eagle on the wings of which they were going to be liberated. Uh, his wife, Vicky, who came originally, what was then known as Persia, had been a member of the French underground in World War II. They were very good people. And religious, the respect observance of the Jewish holidays, is, the high holidays, is a pretty tiring thing. So Jack, who used to come up very often, used to enjoy visiting our place and saying all the tame animals we had, baby chicks hatching and things like that, got the idea that it would be nice if the uh, uh, military personnel of the Washington area and their families could come up and do that. So he asked us, we said, of course, and every year in September, uh, he would bring uh, maybe 30 or 35 people up. And the kids would have a great time. They'd gather eggs, and they'd ride on the backs of cake cows, and uh, they see baby chicks hatching, and they play with them, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. So the FBI turned this into my wife and I celebrating the Russian Revolution. Of course, they could have uh, done it a little bit better. They could have said that we were so anxious to celebrate the Russian Revolution that we did it a month or a month and a half early. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine what happened then at the White House? Do you think when the Johnson never asked another question about me on my work? No, uh, no, I guess not. Oh, Listen, yeah, Harold, Harold, we're going to break away to do some a little work of our own. We'll be right back with you, okay? Right. Hold on. All right, KGO Radio News Talk time is uh, 429. Uh, we're here with uh, Harold Weisberg, uh, the author, author of uh, Whitewash 1 through 4, Oswald in New Orleans, post war him and generally regarded to be probably one of the foremost researchers in this entire area. Uh, Robert Ramfatel is going to have to leave us here also. He'd like to ask a couple of questions before we get to Jay's questions and open it up to the phone lines. Robert? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, Harold, uh, once again, nice to talk to you. And I, I, I guess, my, you know, my final question would be if you could... Uh is, is there anything you're looking forward particularly that we could still find out about this? If you could get your hands on a document or a, or a file, what that would be, whether it be the House Committee files or something that's still locked up by the FBI or the archives. I'd be interested in hearing about that so that people who want to continue doing this kind of stuff might have some ideas on. Well, Bob, that we can find the kind of leads that they did not follow up. Beginning of the day of the assassination, they refused to follow up leads. I've, I've obtained records, for example, from Dallas, where one police department closed up and said, you ought to consider so-and-so a, uh, a suspect because he's known to have made threats against the president. And before Oswald was even charged with the crime, the FBI wrote on it, not necessary to follow as true suspect, true subject located. So it is quite possible we can find what they didn't follow up. But I do not think we will find any smoking gun there because they just didn't follow it up. They refused to investigate. I think that with the passing of time, the most important thing is we have to see to it that our, gov our government can't now function this way again in another such time of great stress. It presents a great trouble to the country, a great hazard. It, it, it's a danger to our system of society, our system of government. So I, I'm continuing, even though I'm not well, because I don't think it's a fruitless task. 
I think it's important and must be continued. But I don't think we're going to find a solution to the crime in the form of a confession by somebody who said, I'm sorry I did it, but I really did it, or anything like that. Well, Robert, uh, you've, you've been more than gracious and generous with your time, and I certainly appreciate your being with us this morning. We've only scratched the surface of this. Maybe next week or week thereafter, we'll do, we'll do the second part of this where we can really get into some of the fine research that you've done in helping uh, with the book, David Lifton's uh, Best Evidence, and also uh, some of the interesting things you've done with the White House War, the untold story of Kennedy and Johnson Feud, another book that you're working on now. Thank you so much. Thank you. And good morning. Okay. Uh, Jay has some questions to ask of you and our listeners certainly do. Harold, Jake, go right ahead. Hello, Mr. Weisberg. Yes, good morning. I, uh, I saw you speak in 1966, I guess it was, at the Hall of Flowers here in San Francisco. I just want to come back to that when, when I started to say something. I don't want to come back to that afterwards. I'm glad to hear from you. And uh, you autographed my book, Whitewash, so, which I still May have. May I say why? <laughs> Tell the story of what, do you remember the audience, how big it was? Yeah. The standing room only? Yeah, I remember that. And I also remember somebody asked you, uh, what's the point of investigating this? What's done is done. And you said at that time, well, if we don't find out who did this, there could be more assassinations. And I remember some people poo-pooed that. And uh, history has proven you wrong. Um, Want there more assassinations? Oh, yes. That's what I said. History has proven you right. Yeah. Um, uh, Some questions I have are just like incidental facts which I'm not clear on and possibly some uh, <clears throat> theory theories which you may go along with or you may not and uh, another question concerns uh, a photograph in whitewash too uh, one of the things that's always bothered me did they ever find out who ordered the washing out of the limousine at the hospital and who ordered the whole interior of that limousine ripped out I believe it was that night no, it was washed out, and that, of course, destroyed a lot of evidence. And we have no way of knowing how many fragments of bullet were lost with it. Mm-hmm. Were any photographs taken of the inside of the uh, limousine? No, there were photographs taken at the time which show a difference, uh, but that, they're just still photographs. And uh, no, there was no photograph taken of the limousine being washed out. Mm-hmm. However, there was a photograph taken in Dallas by a news reporter I have only a dim recollection of this, which shows a bucket of water alongside the limousine. Yeah, I've seen that. And they're also putting the bubble top on top of the limousine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh... it's strange, isn't it, for inf- inf- investigators to work that way? Well, I, I could understand the confusion of somebody ordering it washed out, but I can't understand somebody... They're investigators, man. Oh, I, I know, I know. I, um... I can't understand the whole insides of that being ripped out uh, the same day. That uh, that strikes me as quite odd, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Is there a picture that you wanted to... Do you have another question? Oh, um, uh, also, uh, what happened to, I guess it was the four hobos that were arrested in the train yard, and what was... They the were winos. They were winos. And this is one of the problems uh, with theorizing and, and jumping to conclusions based on it. Uh, more stories have been woven around those people. Some of them wound up in court. They've been identified as everybody uh, from Edgy Eugene Bradley out there in California uh, to Howard Hunt back in Washington, the Watergate figure, and Frank Sturgis down in Florida. Uh, and they are not any of these people. There's a new school of thought down in Dallas that uh, one of the men is a professional hitman who's been convicted of another crime. And one theory had them as paymasters who were there hiding. They were going to pay the men off as soon as they saw the blood. You ever hear that kind of crime? Uh, the actuality is that they were winos who were taken off of a freight car that was a couple blocks away behind the Central Annex Post Office, which is uh, 219 South Houston, I think. And Main Street was where, where the numbers go from north to south to south to north. Uh, and they were walked past the Texas School Book Depository building because that was the closest way to get them off the tracks. There's no more sinister than that. Mm-hmm. But the news photographers were shooting, which is perfectly natural and proper, they were shooting everything that moved. And they never even had time to get the left to right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see, that's the kind of thing that makes theorizing dangerous. Well, that's that's what I was saying earlier tonight. Uh, 
you could say because Kennedy ordered the bubble top off and because he didn't want the Secret Service on the back of the car and because he didn't want the motorcycles beside the limousine that he was part of the conspiracy. If you, you know, it, I mean, that's how people can go off in different directions. I'm not saying anybody has, but you... I just wonder if he's seen by the people. Yeah. And besides that, the bubble top wasn't bulletproof anyway. Right, yeah. Um, one of the problems that I have, like with the Zap Ruder film, the, the fact that um, the shots have been said to have come from the back and the shots have come from the front, when you see the Zap Ruder film, when the president is hit, that pink explosion all goes forward. And it would appear, in looking at the frames later, that there is like a big banana peel wound in the right temple. At the same time, his head snaps back to the left. Um, do you believe that it was two bullets hitting precisely at the same time, or...? At um... the same time, and I said that in my second book. Mm -hmm. After I had written it, mm -hmm. uh, I began to fear that uh, people just wouldn't credit it. Mm -hmm. uh, so far as I know, I was at that time the only one who studied the There's a Peter film uh, after the Warren Commission. Mm -hmm. And I weakened it, but you'll find it in, in Whitewash too, because it's quite obvious when you study the film. And I had a little bit of trouble getting the archives to do it, but they let me do it. And I took my own projector there, uh, a very good one, where it was perfectly safe to work on that copy of the film. And I examined the slow motion and what I found very effective going backward. Uh, it, it may not seem obvious to your audience, but believe me, it's true. Sometimes when you have a motion picture, you can see more by going backward, mm -hmm. uh, running it backward. And it is, it is true that the president's body moves only slightly forward and then violently backward. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I remember, I think it was in 1977-1978, uh, uh, CBS did a... Uh, I guess it was a close-up on the assassination, and they had, I believe it was a uh, CIA uh, photographic uh, analysis on looking at the Zapruder film, and his explanation for the head snap was, well, it's really going forward, but it looks like it's going backwards. You know, that reminds me of something. Uh, I had a reprint, a photographic whitewash, because of all the copies were sold out, and I did, although I don't expect it long enough to sell all of them, and I obtained under freedom of information what remains of a file the CIA had gutted, where its uh, photographic experts examined the Zapruder film at a time when nobody knew how they got a copy of it, or even that they had a copy of it. And their analysis is entirely different than that of the Warren Commission. Hmm. So because they're good patriotic citizens, the CIA never gave it to the Warren Commission. Hmm. Did uh, did you believe uh, uh, the lawyer Andrews uh, uh, comments in your book uh, that that he actually knows who pulled the trigger, but he likes to breathe basically? And, um, well, I, I I knew Dean Andrews very well. I understand he's dead. And he's quite a character, and you never knew where facts started and fancy end. Mm -hmm. And that I don't know. I don't know. Um, I do know that he was that uh, he led me to believe that Clay Shaw really was Clay Bertrand. Uh, in um, I forget which book it is. You, um, I believe, you state an affidavit by a, a sheriff or someone who stopped a man who looked like Oswald coming out of the back of the school book depository right after the assassination, which would indicate a false Oswald. Uh, if this is true, according to your timetable, could that uh, person have gotten down to that point from the sixth floor in that time span? Uh, you know, the commission engaged in a, uh, a rather unusual reconstruction of that. And there was no way in the world in which they could get Oswald away from that sixth floor window and down to where he was actually seen. Uh, by a man who knew, knew him, the man who was the, the boss, Roy Truby, and a policeman. Uh, and every reconstruction, Roy Truby and the policeman got there before Oswald could have. Uh, so the commission really did, as they did on several points, concluded contrary to all of the evidence. Now, with regard to other people, this is one of the lingering mysteries. Uh, now, you understand, of course, that there are such things as look of life, and there are many coincidences, coincidences in life. But those in this case of 
someone counterfeiting Oswald exceeds anything that could be normal or anything that could be mere coincidence. And, and I used in my first book a reference to false Oswalds. Mm -hmm. They did exist. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's fascinating at the very least because it's clear that uh, a, that a trail that would be picked up was being left of people representing themselves as Oswald, but they were not. Speaking, speaking of false Oswalds, at the moment, supposedly, of the volleys taking place, there is a picture of someone who appears to be Oswald uh, outside the book depository building, yet Oswald claims to have been in the lunchroom. Have you resolved that one? Uh, no, that's not quite the way it is. I think I have resolved it. Oswald, of course, we don't know what Oswald really said. All we know is what the police and federal agents say he said. Uh, and because they were investigating a major crime like the assassination of a president, all the police officials destroyed all of their notes. Because they wanted to get a confession from Oswald, they saw to it they had no tape recorder to take down what he said on. So all we know is what their existing versions, some written long thereafter, say. Now, what Oswald actually said is quite probative. He said that he was eating his lunch on the first floor when Junior walked past. Now, there was a man named Junior Jarman. And if you go to the testimony of Junior Jarman, you will find that he confirms Oswald. So this is quite probative. However, the picture you're talking about was taken a few minutes later. It was taken by Ike Hawkins, an Associated Press photographer, and the Warren Commission and the FBI never, ever uh, let a copy of the full picture be seen. The full picture appears for the first time in my second book, Whitewash 2, which gets back, and I want to come back to uh, the Golden Gate Park thing. Now, the... Uh, in pictures, Oswald and a man who has since died by natural causes, Billy Lovelady, yeah. look very much alike. However, their clothing was entirely different. That day. Yes, that day. Now, if you look at the picture of the shirt on the man in the doorway. I'm looking at it now. And if you look in my second book at the picture of the shirt Oswald was wearing that day. Mm-hmm. Uh, they bear remarkable resemblance to each other, don't they? They're identical. Now, uh, then in the second book, you will find a picture of Lovelady in the shirt that the FBI said he was wearing that day. And this has stripes about two inches broad. Uh, <coughs> after my second book was out, and when my third book was at the printer, awaiting only the completion of the index, on a Saturday afternoon, <coughs> And she says, the FBI did not ask my husband to wear the shirt he was wearing that day. And they just took his picture of the shirt he happened to be wearing. The shirt my husband was wearing is unmistakable. And if you look, if you have uh, photographic whitewash there. I do. Uh, why don't you read the description of the shirt that Mrs. Lovelady gives, and then I'll pick up with the story. Uh, let's see, photographic whitewash. I'm taking a look at the shirt at the back of whitewash, too. No, what I'm saying is Mrs. Lovelady's telephone description. Everything else had been done. Everything else was the presses were ready to roll. And then Mrs. Lovelady called me up. Uh, and she says, uh, well, you know, I told you she wants to sell me the shirt for 5000 bucks. <laughs> and I, I, the only place I could add something was in the one thing that the printer hadn't had. And that was the index. So at the back of the index, I have an account that's on page 294. And, uh... Okay, let me, let me, uh... I received a phone call from a woman that, uh, she, uh, she says the checks were about two inches. He had worn a red and black check with a white fleck. The checks, she says, are about two inches. Yeah, I received a phone call from a woman identifying herself as Billy Lovelady. She expressed a greater apprehension for the family safety and protested the FBI evidence, including this printed in whitewash, too. She insisted it is my Billy in the doorway, that the FBI never asked him what shirt he wore in that day, and that he had worn a red and black check with a white flag, fleck, rather. 
The checks, she said, are about two inches. When I said the Altcans picture shows no check, she replied that it is not as clear as the enlargement, as big as a desk, about 30 by 40 inches. That's enough of a description of the shirt. Now, let me tell you what happened. We started looking around in Dallas for films, and we found a film taken by a man named Martin, which was overexposed, but actually shows the doorway. And in it, there is Billy Lovelady, where even in the great magnification of 8mm film taken from a block away, it is, uh, he is in a shirt that perfectly matches Mrs. Lovelady's description, and it is different than the man you see in the Orkin picture. So you see, both Oswald and Lovelady were there, and if Oswald was there, he could not have been on the sixth floor at the same time, could he? So you think he ate his lunch and then came outside to see the motorcade? As a matter of fact, Carolyn Arnold, one of the employees of the building, uh, saw him there and told the FBI that. So when the FBI realized that they had a problem here, they maybe changed the time that Mrs. Arnold said she saw Oswald from 12.25 to 12.15. And then when, when the FBI was sent back to take a statement by the Warren Commission from each of the people who worked at the, took the Texas School Book Depository Building, including such questions as where they were at the time the president was killed, mm. she said <clears throat> she put the correct time down, 12.25. Even then, the FBI tried to hide it, so they put the wrong date down, and she had to correct that when she signed the statement. We had a call from a woman from Oxnard, uh, California, l earlier this morning, who claims that a phone call came through the switchboard of the General Telephone Company. They're uh, indicating that the president would be shot at 10:10 our time, Pacific Coast, Pacific Standard Time, and that later called back and said amended. That'll be 12:10:30, uh, uh, and it actually happened. Uh, had you heard about that? No, I had. Uh, that's interesting. Well, we, before we forget, I'd like to get back to something I think may interest your audience. Sure. It's where we were before we started asking questions. All right. About this meeting at Golden Gate Park. Uh -huh. Now, the night before, I was on uh, a show that Hart Morgan then had, and Jim Easton, who's on your station, uh, was a friend of Hart's, and that's the night I met Jim. Right. And Jim was in the audience. It was just Hart's wife, Jim, and me. And hard, and uh, the telephone call comes in. My guy who tries to make out I'm a communist, and he, you know, he, he's out to uh, assault me and my book. Uh, clearly, an effort to destroy the book. Well, that uh, attracted a lot of attention and led to the uh, standing room when the only crowd at the Hall of Flowers. Well, it turns out that that guy was an FBI informer. Now, the immediate effect was that every copy of my books in San Francisco sold out the next day. Uh, but, but here you have an FBI informer calling up a radio station, interfering with what it was doing, interfering with what an author was doing, and trying to ruin the book. Well, that uh, attracted a lot of attention and led to the uh, standing room when the only crowd was at the Hall of Flowers. Well, it turns out that that guy was an FBI informer. Now, the immediate effect was that every copy of my books in San Francisco sold out the next day. Uh, but, but here you have an FBI informer calling up a radio station, interfering with what it was doing, interfering with what an author was doing, and trying to ruin the book. Now, the night before, something also interesting happened that I'd like to go into, uh, because in effect I'm going to be making an appeal. Uh, the night before, about quarter of one in the morning, I'm in Oakland on a show that uh, Joe Dolan used to have. And I'm talking about Oswald as the official story has Oswald. And a guy calls up, and he doesn't want to talk to me on the air. He's afraid. Uh, but he says that uh, he was in the Marine Corps with Oswald, and the Oswald that the official story has is not the Oswald he knew. So I have a friend who was uh, at the station, and he he brought the note into the studio telling me this. And I wrote on the note, please ask the man to wait. I'll be off in 15 minutes. So the, the man was a little bit uneasy. But he, and he says exactly what this note has said, that the Oswald you're talking about is not the Oswald I knew. And then he told me this story. 
Now, I checked some of this out in New Orleans, and the things that the Warren Commission records do not show about Oswald, and the FBI records that I got since do not show about Oswald. Well, that's really true. Oswald uh, was hung up on both chess and pool. He loved to shoot pool. As a boy in New Orleans, he used to haunt the pool holes. And he says the Oswald I knew was a serious-minded man. He didn't have a good education, but he was very well informed. He didn't go around looking for trouble. He was quiet. And uh, he was a very trusted man. He was one of five men in our outfit who had crypto clearance, C-R-Y-P-T-O. Well, in my day in intelligence, there was no crypto clearance, so I don't know what that was. It turns out that crypto, as a prerequisite, requires that you have top secret clearance. So this man, who didn't want to tell me about Oswald, because he had just started a business in that area and didn't want to get involved in a way that could be hurtful to him, didn't want to identify himself, and I kept my word. I didn't try to identify him. I could have. He told me, for example, that he was going to be in Washington uh, that September, the coming September, uh, for a convention. Well, it wouldn't have been that hard to check around who was in the San Francisco area at the conventions in Washington in September, but the man wanted anonymity. I promised to him, and I have not broken my word. However, 20 years have passed, and if that man is listening, or if anybody knows him, I certainly would like to talk to him again. One of the things that is not generally known is that Oswald's career in the Marine Corps always had him in association with the CIA activity. You will not find this in Oswald's Marine Corps records. Each time he was off on such a project that was a CIA project, the records show only that he was on maneuvers. The Marine Corps records show that he was stationed at a U-2 base in Japan, Atsugi. But his personnel records do not show that he was also stationed for six months at another CIA base, Subi Point in the Philippines. And he was. Uh, he was involved in at least one effort to overthrow uh, the leftist government of Sukarno in Indonesia. As I remember, it's called Operation Strongback. So here you have an official investigation in which the only candidate for assassin is Lee Harvey Oswald. And the man turns out to have had a top secret crypto security clearance. And that does not come out in the investigation. That's one hell of an investigation. Carol, Phil, hang on. We're going to do some business. We'll be right back with you. KJ Radio East Talk Time is 4.56, Noah Griffin here. Uh, we're here with Harold Weisberg, and let's go to line four. Okay. Uh, line four, you there? Hi, Noah. Yes. This is Mike Lee. Oh, hi, Mike. How are you doing? Oh, good. Heard you're a new proud daddy. Yes, I certainly am. That's, that's what I had to say about new life. Let's get into uh, taking lives. I really think that Harold hit it on the head with the FBI. As far as the conspiracy, you know, fantastic coincidences happen once in a while. Yeah. But they don't seem to happen that often to me. And there's just too many coincidences, too many FBI um, involvements like uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's involvement and Jack Ruby's involvement. Personally, I think, I used to believe that Richard Nixon had something to do with it, but I think it was J. Edgar Hoover, and I can say that because the guy is no longer living, but I think a lot of people are really worse then and probably still now afraid of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. Harold, you can respond? Pardon me? Do you care to respond, Harold? Uh, well, I don't think Hoover had anything to do with killing President Kennedy, but he certainly had everything to do with saying, that, saying to us that the crime was never investigated. This is one reason why I was trying to reach the man who called me up in 1966. And may I add one thing, please, Noah? Sure. His listening, or any friends of his, or people who know him are listening, that although it's not my full address, if he addresses me as Harold Weisberg, W-E-I-S-B-E-R-G, mm -hmm. Route 12, Frederick, Maryland, it will reach me. And I would love to hear from him because we must go back and do as much as we can of the job the FBI should have done and didn't do. And one of these things is learning more about Oswald. 
Noah. Yeah, Mike. What I was going to say is somebody who is smart enough to uh, do all the things that Oswald did, why would he leave his fingerprints, write out the application for the gun himself? That, that's exactly what Harold uh, Hell says here, and and thank you so much for your call, Harold. Hang on with us. We'll be back with you into the next hour. Appreciate you being here. Okay, we're talking with Harold Weisberg, former Senate investigator, editor, investigative reporter, and uh, the work that he's done on the uh, investigation of the death of uh, the killing of John F. Kennedy. We're here also with Jay Davis, and we'll continue on until six o'clock. Please stay with us as well. Good morning and welcome back to the studio with us is Jay Davis and also Harold Weisberger who is the former Senate investigator, editor, investigative reporter, OSS intelligence and political analyst. He's done the definitive investigation and research and writing on the Kennedy assassination and its official inquest. Uh, why don't we go take some of the phone calls so that people, people and have a chance to talk with uh, Harold. Line three, you're on the air with Harold Weisberg and Jay Davis. Good morning. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I can't hear here. this, man. Okay, uh, could you speak up, sir? Can you hear me now? Barely. Okay. Uh, does anyone there know whether there has been a voice stress analysis of Oswald denying shooting the president? And if so, what were the results? Has there been a voice stress analysis of Oswald's denying killing the president? And if so, what are the results? Whatever the results are, they're not worth the paper they're written on. Uh, one of the foremost experts of the voice stress analysis uh, did a, a so-called analysis on the voice of the man, Dr. Humes, who was in charge of the autopsy of President Kennedy, and he said it proves Dr. Humes is an honest man. Uh -huh. Dr. Dr. Humes said that the president was shot in the base of the neck when he was shot in the back, and he said that the president was shot at the level of the occiput, which is the knob on the back of your head when he was shot four inches higher. So, uh, there have, people have done these kinds of things, and I'm afraid they just are totally undependable. There, there is no substitution for fact and an investigation of this kind, and, that, and even if that was dependable, you would find endless controversy about the opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, several months ago, a little under two years ago, a woman called Jimmy's show. She claimed to be a San Francisco resident with perhaps a nephew, but a close relative who was in the Secret Service and attached to John Kennedy's people during the assassination. She claims that he was shot as part of the situation and was unavailable to anyone for several months. And when he did reappear, he still had a scar of the wound. Have you heard about any Secret Service men being shot during the assassination? I can only hear part of that, but I know you asked about a Secret Service man who was shot during the assassination, and it just isn't true. Uh -huh. uh, what is the origin of the 20-year uh, curse uh, of the president's dying? I understand it has something to do with the Indian chief to come to. Can you expand on that? I couldn't understand enough. And well, he, he asked the origin of the 20-year curse on the president's or, uh, dying. He's, he claimed it. He says he understood it had something to do with the curse of uh, the Indian chief to come to. I don't know anything about that. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, have any studies been made to find who might have profited as a result of selling short uh, by, in other words, knowing that there would be a drop in the stock market and being in a position to have commitments to sell when they could subsequently buy on a depressed stock market? I think there, uh, that's a traditional lawyer's way of approaching the question, and they use the Latin qui bono, who benefits. And I think that uh, there are some things you can do that way, but 
but there's a limit to how far you can go that way. Uh, you can eliminate uh, suspects, those who did not profit, for example. But one of the most obvious uh, places you would look and follow and asking yourself who benefited uh, were those who were opposed to President Kennedy's policies. And this, of course, points a finger at what Mr. Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex, and I have thought of as the intelligence military-industrial complex. And bearing on that, what is not very well known, but is a fact, is that President Kennedy had ordered the liquidation of our adventure in Vietnam. It had begun, and three days after he was killed, the Pentagon issued a statement saying we have re-evaluated our re-evaluation and found it was optimistic. Was it, was it supposedly the hunch that, that, that uh, financed the dis distribution of that uh, Kennedy wanted for treason literature around Dallas the, the morning of his murder? No, it was a number of people, and one of Hunt's sons uh, contributed money to it. Uh, and the money really was contributed to a newspaper ad, which was uh, pretty much the same thing. There were two different things, a leaflet and a newspaper ad. Never called as witnesses, right? No. Before the commission. As a matter of fact, that one of the first things I do in my first writing, in the introduction to my first book, is to criticize the, the Warren Commission for not giving these people a chance to say whatever they wanted to say and not asking these people questions. Okay. But uh, Jay uh, has a question for you. I, I know we're jumping around a bit, but I, I've always had this question in my mind. Uh, was the code book really missing from the plane that was on the way to Japan with uh, most of the cabinet? And if so, did they ever find out? I don't know, and I don't know if it makes any difference in this case if it was. Oh, huh. okay. Well, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, I don't think it does make any difference. Okay, let's get to Ron Eight South Bay. You're on KGO it's with Harold Weisberg and Jay Davis. Good morning. How are you doing? Hi, fine. Hey, Peter, I'm just saying, is that can hear it, Noah? Okay, I'll repeat the question, Harold. Uh, I don't really have a question. I've, I've been on the line now for about an hour and a half, and you've made me more of a believer than what I was before I got on the phone. But one thing that I can't understand, you see these specials on television on how Kennedy was assassinated, and I've got a, a buddy of mine that, that's uh, into the Kennedy assassination, and he showed me pictures of the uh, the Bruder uh, film. Right. And it's obvious to me that the, the first bullet that hit Kennedy uh, came from the front of the car and knocked him backwards. The second from the back and... and uh, you mean the other way around, don't you, or do you? No, I think... Okay. Well, his theory is that the, the Zapruder film shows that uh, the, the first bullet came from the front of the car, and he feels the second one came from the back. And, and what else did you want to say, sir? No, isn't, isn't it true that Oswald was behind him when Oswald shot him? And isn't it therefore true that, uh, and isn't it true that Oswald was, was behind him when the shots rang out? He's, he's, this man is accurate on all counts. Let me tell you how you can check this for yourself, Noah, by looking in the index to postmortem under Dr. Charles Carrico. The first doctor who saw President Kennedy and under whose supervision President Kennedy's clothes were taken off was Charles Carrico. Uh, he saw the wound in the front of the neck and the President's clothing was cut off. Uh, the holes made in the collar were not made by a bullet, they were made by a scalpel. And the President's uh, physicians had a press conference uh, to announce the President's death and they at several points said that the president had been shot from the front. The president, in fact, was shot above the shirt collar. Dr. Carrick, who twice told the Warren Commission that it was above the shirt collar. So it, it is completely impossible for the bullet, ostensibly the first bullet, to have hit the president in the back of the neck and come out the front of the neck at a higher point and then going downward and so forth to hit Governor Conley. Well, let, let, could you clearly give us the sequence of, 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 the, of the shots so that we can all understand it uh, as, as you perceive them to, to be here? We don't know enough, but I can give you the official sequence. The official sequence is that the first shot hit the president in the back of the neck, came out in the front of the neck, hit Governor Conley underneath the right armpit, came out underneath his right nipple after smashing four inches of his fifth rib, and then lodged itself in his left thigh to come out in some magical, mysterious way at the hospital where it could be found. The second shot missed entirely and struck a curbstone at the 
diagonally opposite corner of Dealey Plaza, and a spray of concrete wounded a bystander named Jim Tegg, and the third shot exploded in the president's head. Now, this leaves too many things unexplained. Is it? The FBI and the Secret Service both avoided the missed shot because they knew enough about firearms to know that the official story was impossible, and they couldn't possibly attribute the shooting to Oswald or to any one man if there was a fourth shot to account for the missed shot. So they entirely ignored the missed shot. Okay, and caller, you say that the, the, you're looking at the, your viewing of the Zabruder film indicates that there was a... Would you, you give give us your sequence, please? Well, I don't I don't see the first shot coming uh, from his back into his neck into Connolly. I might have missed that, but I do see very clearly, and this is what upset me. I mean, it's very clear that there is a shot that is taken from his uh, his front, and it whips his head back. That's the first one. Let me let me say something that may help un uh, your audience understand this. Uh, it's quite in accord with what this man is saying. Uh, there was a point at which the president was hidden from the camera by a road sign. When he first is seen in the Zapruder film coming from behind the road sign, his hands are at the front of his neck, not on his back. And it shows very clearly that he's reacting to a wound in the front of his neck. And that could not have been a wound shot, uh, from above. And a backup. Okay. I've heard the theory put forward that the uh, first shot hit him in the back where it shows on the autopsy, and it uh, blew a bit of uh, bone fragments up <clears throat> into his throat or punctured his throat. Uh, you have any opinions on that? Well, I don't know about the puncturing part, but uh, we still don't know the entire Now, uh, in my first book, my own analysis of the Zapruder film indicated the shot I forgot now, I think around frame 189. And I think that some of the analysis of the, for the House Committee confirms that uh, we really don't know because they did, never investigated the crime. Remember I said that the CIA itself made a secret analysis of the film and their analysis also was of a shot that was earlier than the official story. Uh, what I said to begin with, since we don't, since the crime itself was never investigated, we can't say. Now I'm looking at uh, an analysis uh, made by the CIA. This is the form of the chart, page 303 of the reprint of the photographic white wash. And at one point, the CIA constellated a shot at frame 190 as considered being earlier than the one of the machine said, earlier than frame 210. Uh, another place they, uh, they postulate frame 206 when the president was. Uh, and could not have been hit from the sixth floor window because he was blocked by a tree at both of these points. So there is no reason to doubt that they were an earlier shot. It's just that the official story couldn't survive any admission of an earlier shot. That's all. If, if he had been shot in the throat from the front, though, wouldn't there have been an exit warning? Uh, yes, probably. Uh, but we still don't know. One of the things that's... Uh, for example, uh, when uh, uh, Colonel Fink... Uh, the Army pathologist reached the Bethesda Navy Hospital and found out that the entire president's body hadn't been x-rayed. He testified to the Warren Commission that he asked that full body x-rays be made. And the testimony is that they were made. They don't exist today. So we don't know. when. Once a bullet hits a bone or hits a body, there's just no predicting what it's going to do. Uh, we still don't know whether a shot entered the front and came out the back because the tissue studies are no are not available. Do you follow me? Yes. Uh, I asked uh, Robert when he was here what he thought about the uh, House uh, Commission on Assassination using scientific drawings of the photographs, I guess, of the head wounds rather than the actual photographs. And I wondered your opinion on that. My opinion is that those are the real photographs and they were not fake. Mm -hmm. If they were going to fake them, they would do a much better job. The photographs as they exist utterly destroy the Warren Commission solution and the integrity of the Warren Commission. Uh, so while there are many questions remaining about all of these things, I do not believe that they are fake. <clears throat> okay, let's go to uh, line two. Noah Griffin, you're on KGO with Harold Weisberg and Jay Davis. Good morning. Hello. Yes, sir. My name is Nick. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you on your work. I thought you might be interested in this, but uh, more like, if anything, you've drawn the conclusion already. What was interesting to me at the time of the assassination, the assassination was 
was that uh, my father was in military intelligence, and uh, he draw, uh, drew the conclusion at the time to the effect that the reason why there was such a uh, scandal over the assassination was that the government couldn't admit to it, was the fact that the CIA, this was his conclusion, planned, plotted, and uh, killed the president over uh, a Vietnam issue, which Kennedy was going to announce that he was going to pull out of Vietnam. Do you have any comments over that? Well, it's cons it's cons I, first of all, I don't think that as an official act, the CIA did it. Uh, I think it's quite possible that self-starters who consider themselves true patriots could have done it. And I think that Vietnam is a reasonable basis for it. What most people don't understand is that President Kennedy's policies changed dramatically at the time of the Cuba Missile Crisis in October 1962. And he and Khrushchev were leading into a rapprochement. Remember that President Kennedy started detente with a limited test ban agreement that was negotiated. President Kennedy stated American policy to be that we would never recognize a military dictatorship that overthrew a freely elected government. Three weeks after President Kennedy was killed, President Johnson recognized the, Dom the Dominican military dictatorship. In Vietnam, I told you that he had ordered the liquidation of Vietnam, and it had begun. Uh, 223 men, as I remember, came back before he was killed. Then all of a sudden we had a half million men there. Policy was changed. So while we don't know, and the nature of the available information does not permit a definitive conclusion, you can say that there were people in the CIA who felt that they were doing a patriotic thing if they were to kill President Kennedy. Good point. Okay, let's uh, go to line one. Noah Griffin, you're on KGO. Harold Weisberg and Jay Davis, good morning. Hi, Jim here. Uh, uh, last year there was a program uh, about a big organized crime figure that died in Florida several years ago. I'm uh, sorry, I can't remember his name. Was it Traficante? But um, uh, it was said in that program on the television that he was blackmailing J. Edgar Hoover because he had made films of uh, Hoover in a hotel room having a uh, homosexual relationship with uh, another man. <laughs> and uh, this uh, provided a sort of explana uh, explanation as to why the FBI never really, um, never really um, investigated organized crime in this country very thoroughly. And, and you may have heard complaints over the years that the FBI always seems to look the other way the mob and mafia and stuff. Are you trying to are, can you connect this up with the uh, Kennedy assassination? And yes, I'm connecting it up and saying that uh, there's been complaints like the one in Toronto and the other one in Los Angeles in the last Did you catch any of that, Harold? I couldn't. Let me say this. Yes. In with, all your callers in were quite clear, and they're becoming increasingly inaudible to me. Well, maybe I can uh, augment, uh, amplify a little bit uh, what, what they're saying. She uh, claimed that uh, there's a mafia figure who was killed in Florida. Uh, who had uh, pictures of J. Edgar Hoover in a compromising homosexual position in a hotel room. I and, doubt it. And that uh, they were trying to black the, blackmail the, uh, the director, and therefore the mafia got uh, preferred status treatment in certain instances. No, I, I doubt it, and I don't think that Hoover was a homosexual. I think Hoover, Hoover just had no interest in sex except the prurient interest in sex. He loved to have all these stories and pictures told to him and showed to him from all that we know, but it, it was not a matter of his own participation in anything. Okay. Let's go to uh, line eight in the South Bay. You're on KGO with Harold Weisberg and Jay Davis. Good morning. Yeah, how are you doing? I've got a couple questions. All right, go ahead, sir. Uh, two things. Uh, first is the silhouette in the bushes. The films that they've got, uh, you can look through the, through the bushes and, cl and not clearly, but it looks like there's a guy... Uh, standing on the floorboard of a car, resting a rifle on top of a roof of the car, and also the man resting 
uh, at a, in a kneeling position in the bushes on the grassy you knoll. Now, before you go on to the second question, I heard enough of that. Uh, I can't answer that directly, but I can give you a, a, an, an explanation and an account of something similar. Uh, some people in Dallas got a better print of a picture taken by Mary Mormon. It was a, a Polaroid originally, but they got uh, a regular picture of it. And they did some photo enlargement. And I saw this uh, this past October. And I think their enlargement leaves it without reasonable doubt that there is a man visible in the bushes in that picture. Now, I sort of exercised good offices between the people who had done that work and a publication and made a deal that in return for having computer enhancement, a uh, publication would have the rights. So they arranged for MIT to do the computer enhancement. And the professor at MIT sent these people to a private organization he was connected to of experts. And they did the computer enhancement, and they were absolutely fascinated and shocked. They not only were satisfied beyond doubt that this was a person, uh, but uh, the expert said that he thought he saw a second person there. And at that point, MIT became unglued. Uh, instead of doing additional work that was indicated, they told the people from the publication, if you say you were here, we will deny it. If you say that we've done this work, we will deny we didn't know anything about it. And they wouldn't even return to him for tape. That's believable. I couldn't hear you. That's, a, that's unbelievable. It's true. It happened. Yeah. Uh, one other thing, uh, when I was waiting on the line, I heard uh, one of the other, the, the other speaker there in the studio say about the picture, supposedly, of Oswald in front of the book depository at the time of the shooting. Now, what I saw is a picture of Oswald in whatever he was wearing, I forget, I, I can't remember, and a picture of a person that the government or that the police said was the person standing in front of the book depository. And he was wearing something completely different than the picture of the per of Oswald that was standing in front of the book depository. Is that true? I went into that earlier. That's the Billy Lovelady story. Yeah. Right. Uh... Did you say that was true? I, I forgot what you had said, but... Well, I, I think Harold... Sure. Well, Harold can speak for himself, but he said that uh, his, his wife, Harold had contacted Lovelady's wife, uh, and, and, and she claims that it was an entirely different shirt, and that he didn't wasn't told to wear the same shirt to the Warren Commission that he wore, and she produced evidence of the shirt that he did wear, which was totally different from the one that uh, uh, Oswald had on. And then we found a picture of a shirt exactly meeting her description on another man in roughly the same place. It wasn't in front of the building. It was on the steps of the entrance to the building. In front of the doorway. Yes, right in the doorway. Right. Okay, one last question and then I'll get off. These pictures they've, they've got of Oswald with a gun in, say, his backyard or, or holding a gun, right? Yes. The shadow, isn't it true that the shadow of his body is going, say, to the right and the shadow of his head to the left? I don't remember that exact detail. I think you're right. But let me tell you another story of some fine work done for me by a Californian, who, a man who was then in Los Angeles, a commercial artist, Fred Newcomb. I asked him, I brought to him two pictures. They're exhibits 133A and 133B that supposedly were taken with Oswald's camera. And they just seem to be... No change in the expression on the face, which seemed to be unlikely, and other things like that. So I asked him, how would he compare these things? And he said, well, the first thing I would do would be to make two enlargements of the same size and overlay them. And he did. He had uh, two large negatives made, and I still have them, uh, where the heads were identical. He overlaid these two, and there was not even the difference in an eyelash. But what you do find is that there's a difference in the body length of about five inches. Oh. So there is, uh, there is something funny about these pictures. I can't tell you what they are, uh, but, but certainly uh, there is something funny about them because it is uh, exactly the same head on both pictures, and there's a difference of about five inches in height. Okay. Well, I just want to tell you, gentlemen, that uh, I am a firm and strong believer in Oswald did not kill Kennedy. I don't care what anybody says. There's much to back you up on that. And, yeah. 
and what I've read, I haven't really gotten into it, but what I would like to know real quick is who I can get in contact with or what... Well, what? Is anything being done about trying to find the real people, person, or whatever that killed Kennedy? I think that the only thing any person can do is to keep on trying, write the congressmen, write the senators, write the newspapers, for whatever little effect it seems to have, it may at some point uh, have an accumulated effect. Okay. And uh, other people can do what I'm trying to do, bring out whatever the officials are still hiding. Sure. Okay. Yeah. They are definitely hiding something. Yes, of course. Kennedy that wasn't killed by Oswald. There's no way. And you can just tell that by just looking at the Zabrudo film. Well, if they have nothing to hide, why in the world would they be hiding so much? Why would they be resisting lawsuits that I have, for example? I have lawsuits that have been in court for as much as over a decade. I have two before, still before the courts, one I filed in 1975, one I filed in 1978. Our Freedom of Information Act says 10 days. What about uh, the the 7.65 Mauser or so that, that supposedly was the weapon that they found in the sixth floor, uh, identifying it as the murder weapon initially and then changing it to a Malachar Carcano? Well, uh, there's two of those incidents. One said that one was found on the roof and the other said it was found on the sixth floor. With regard to the sixth floor, I think it was just an honest mistake. And with regard to finding one on the roof, it's an open question. Do you think Oswald did any of the shooting, or, or did, or any of the shooting, did any of the shooting come from the sixth floor? Well, that's two different questions. I'm inclined to think that Oswald did no shooting at all. All right. Uh, and I have no reason to believe that any of the shooting came from the sixth floor. All of the evidence that tends to indicate that is corrupted in one way or another. Do you think it came from the building at uh, Kitty Corner to the school book depository? Quite possible. But I go back to the first thing I said, in the absence of a real investigation, we can't really know. Right. Okay, can, Harold, can you hang on for a bit? We've got to do some business, and we'll be right back with you. Sure. Okay, we're talking with uh, Harold Weisberg, the author of Whitewash 1 through 4, Postmortem, Oswald in New Orleans. We're here also with Jay Davis, and we'll be right back. Hey, Joe, ready? News talk time is 531. If you're looking for an asset management account that gives you high-quality services without the high price tag, stop looking. It's here at Charles Schwab & Company, America's leading discount broker. Compare Schwab 1 with the other asset management accounts. With Schwab 1, there is no monthly or annual fee, none. When you buy or sell securities, you save up to 76% in stock brokerage commissions compared to rates of full commission brokers. You can borrow on your marginable securities at low interest rates. Get high interest on cash between investments. A free Visa card and free checking account. You can open a Schwab 1 account with only $5,000, not $20,000 like the others. Schwab 1, all the financial services you need without the high price tag. For a free Schwab 1 brochure and application form called Toll Free in the Continental U.S., 800-554-9600. No salesperson will call. That's 800-554-9600. Charles Schwab, a Bank America company, member SIPC. It's the final weekend of our giant $5 million clearance sale at Western Appliance in San Jose. This is Shadow Callahan. RCA Color TV for just $249. RCA Color TV with remote control, $369. Or a big 25-inch tag of RCA Fine Furniture Console Color TV, just $469. That RCA video display is only $179. And at Western, an RCA 8-hour video recorder with 7-function remote control. Special effects like freeze frame, forward and reverse search, just $499. Free membership at our movie club when you buy at Western. Big savings on RCA's big movie screen TV. That's the big 45-inch diagonal that gives you a picture bigger than life. You can have the big screen RCA TV in your home in time for the Olympics. This is it, the final weekend of our giant $5 million clearance sale. Come to Western Appliance in San Jose. We think we can save you money. We deliver anywhere in Northern California. Western Appliance TV and Serial, 1976 West End College in San Jose, or our famous TV and Serial store in downtown Los Gatos. The news talk time is 5.33. Noah Griffin here with Harold Weisberg on the line and Jay Davis. We're trying to, uh, to clear up a lot of unanswered questions that many of you may have, and we still have about uh, the Warren Commission report and the investigation and the assassination of uh, John Kennedy. Jay, you had a couple more questions. I have a, a few questions that I'll throw out to you, and I guess you can answer it in... Uh, may I the... please interrupt for a minute and go sure. back to the last thing? Go ahead, Harold. Off for a commercial, something occurred to me. The man said, what can we do? 
I'd like to suggest something else that everybody can do. Uh, everybody can write as congressman and as senator and say, don't let them touch the Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. It bespeaks the uniqueness of the American concept of self-government and that people do have a right to know what their government does. And if we can avoid um, the gutting of the Freedom of Information Act, it may be possible to bring more of this information to light. So that is something that everybody can do. Write your congressman and senator and say, leave the Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act alone. Oh, Harold, there, there was one other thing that happened yesterday before Jay jumps in here. Is uh, We got a phone call, and we mentioned this earlier in the program. It's for your benefit, not for the benefit of listeners that have already heard this. Yesterday morning from an individual whose father was high up in the police department in San Francisco in 1965 when members of the Dallas Police Department came here to see if they could shore up part of their security. And over a dinner table conversation, this individual related that uh, Ruby was given a press pass and that's by the chief of police, and that's how he happened to be in, in the Dallas Police uh, Department building that day that he shot uh, Oswald. Had you heard that? Not a press pass, but he did have such a thing, and I think it was signed uh, by uh, Justice of the Peace. Uh, it exists in the official evidence. Mm. Okay, Jay. Uh, I have some questions that I just thought I'd run through real fast, and you can answer them according to... Uh, the importance. Uh, doesn't the Alkins photo that shows uh, a person that appears to be Oswald on the front steps of the book depository show the president reacting to the first shot, his um, arms coming up to his throat, and show a crack in the windshield? I don't know about the crack in the windshield, but there is absolutely no question about it. That picture shows the president with both hands at the front of his throat. Mm -hmm. At the, at the uh, time when Oswald was supposed to be on the sixth floor. Yes. Uh, what about the shooting uh, uh, attempt, attempted shooting of General Walker? Is there really any connection? And None. I, I was uh, perhaps theorizing in my mind that perhaps um, the shooting of General Walker could have been a setup, could have been a fake, just to uh, kind of show that Oswald did have uh, violent tendencies. They used it for that purpose, even though they knew it was not Oswald. And let me tell you, both the Dallas police and the FBI, for different reasons, knew that it was not Oswald. And I've got their records. The Dallas police said it was a 30 caliber bullet, and this was a smaller, but Oswald's rifle was a smaller caliber, uh, 6.5 millimeter. That's a little bit over a quarter of an inch. Now, the FBI did a spectrographic analysis of Oswald's bullets and the bullet used to issue the General Walker. And the spectrographic analysis shows that they were entirely different ammunition. So that doesn't make any difference. Facts don't get in your way when you're trying to cover something up or whitewash. And the Warren Commission really used, misused this and was lying to say this showed Oswald's tendency toward violence. Mm. On uh, the inside cover of Whitewash 2, you have, I guess, an enlarged section of the Alkins uh, yes. photograph. The man in the doorway. Right. Uh, was that ever resolved as to who that was or what was going on there? The, uh, no, nobody ever... I tell you, I spent the day of this funeral, I spent two hours with one of his lawyers, Albert Birch, in Chicago, who just come from the funeral. I have to be in Chicago to be doing the talk show that he was on. And the arrangements in the studio had gone wrong, and we had a couple hours to kill waiting for them to get it set up, and we spent two hours talking about it. And while I had many disagreements with Elmer Gertz, he's an honest man, an honorable man, and he was absolutely satisfied that Ruby died of natural causes. Uh, what, uh, what theory did, did, do you think Garrison actually wound up with, and, and, and is it supportable? I don't know that he had any one theory to the exclusion of all others. He went from one theory to another. Uh -huh. It didn't make any difference how much one contradicted the other. He forgot about everything except the one that was current. I saw him making some of these things up. It was a mind blower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you think there was any validity to uh, uh, Ferry and uh, Clay, Shaw. Clay Shaw as far as being linked? Assassination? Yeah. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I did a lot of work in New Orleans. I never had any interest in Clay Shaw. I was interested in Oswald, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot about Oswald that the FBI and the Warren Commission didn't tell us. Uh, and I just thought that Garrison had his own case, and I was shocked to find out that it was no case because I had nothing to do with his investigation at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew him, and I was in his office from time to time, and he spoke to me, 
and I spoke to him. Uh, but I, was, I had no official status at all. What other assassinations do you see this linked with, or possibly linked with? I don't think you can link them in any except one way, and that is that they serve similar purposes. They came in the career of the prominent and important people in the time of their careers when they had undergone major changes. For example, John Kennedy had been a hawk. He died a dove. He died a man seeking peace, cutting military appropriations and trying to reducing nuclear testing and trying to, do, to reduce nuclear arms. Dr. King, for example, uh, had been marching and preaching for years and had been regarded by many racists as an uppity nigger all his life. But nobody killed him until he came to realize that nonviolence was a method that would succeed only when there was a moral conscience to which appeal could be made. He found that moral conscience lacking in this country. And he suddenly, he started a poor people's campaign. He started becoming the postman for all of those who lack what they want to have out of life. Well, that's the end of the undergone a radical transformation at the time he was killed. May I say one of his bodyguards was a police informer. Uh, Robert Kennedy had been a hawk. Mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy wasn't killed until after he became a dove, came out against the war in Vietnam, had just won the California primary, and gave every prospect of being the next president of the United States. So it's remarkable. It, I don't know if it has any significance, but how much can you attribute to mere coincidence? Here you have four illustrations of important political assassinations, everyone coinciding with a radical change in the policies of prominent men, all of whom are in positions of leadership. Now, yeah. getting, getting back to the, the Kennedy thing, do you, uh, we asked Robert Rampell in the studio here if he believed that, uh, I don't know if it was on mic or off, that uh, Oswald kid killed a tippet. He said, und undoubtedly, uh, without a doubt, absolutely, he said. Well, what is your feeling on this? Oswald killed tippet? Yes. I disagree. For what reasons? Uh, first of all, I don't even know if Oswald was there. There's no proof that Oswald was there. Second of all, all the evidence again is tainted. Now, the Warren Commission engaged in a reconstruction of the Tippett murder. And in their reconstruction, Oswald couldn't have gotten there until not quite five minutes after it was announced on the police radio. And there certainly was a little bit of time left between the killing and the broadcast on the police radio. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert said that uh, a test had been made that and it had showed that Oswald had fired a weapon, although it wasn't on his cheek, it was on his hands. Now, that's one of the most interesting things of all, that you're referring to what's called a nitrate, nitrate, nitrate test. Nitrate. And what they do is to make casts with paraffin, and then they test the paraffin to see if they pick up nitrates. Now, they made them of both the hands and the face. They did pick up nitrate on the hands, but none on the face. However, picking up the nitrate from the hand does not mean that he fired a weapon. It means that he had handled something which could leave such deposits. And this ranges through a whole wide variety of things, but particularly one of the things that will do that is the printed page books. And Oswald made a living handling books. However, the nitrate tests were subjected to neutron activation analysis, and this was kept secret. I learned it in one of my Freedom of Information lawsuits. And it was done at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, with the FBI riding herd on everything and dictating what would and would not be done. They went through a test firing down there. They, oh, by the way, they entirely ignored uh, the absence of nitrate tests on Oswald's face, which indicates that he didn't fire a rifle. It doesn't prove that he fired a pistol, mm -hmm. but it does prove that he didn't fire a rifle. And I think there were some eight tests made, and every one of these resulted in a deposit of nitrates on the face. Mm -hmm. Do you have any problem with uh, the fact that, uh, I guess it was Frazier, who drove him to work, said he saw Oswald walking 50 feet ahead of him carrying a package which was under his armpit, and then uh, a witness, I forget his name, who was the first one to see him come through the doors of the school book depository, said he had nothing in his hands. 
I don't have any problem with it. I published it mm-hmm. in my first book. I think this is all probative. 100% of the evidence is that Oswald could not have carried a package holding a rifle into the building. I, I know that, but, but I, I understand that, but how do you explain the disappearance of this package where one person sees him carrying it, who's walking behind him, and then when he comes through the door, uh, they don't see anything in his hand? They never looked for it. Hmm. Uh, I can explain it very easily. Uh, the, uh, there was a, uh, a lower addition to the building to the west of it, and the employees ordinarily left things in there. It's a garage-like building, and it's very simple. Oswald left it there to pick it up when he left work. Hmm. The, re- the, the, tr- the retracing of Oswald's steps supposedly right after the assassination, do you think that was accurate? I don't know. Uh, some of it just doesn't make sense. It does not make sense that Oswald would have created the monstrous traffic jam caused by the assassination and then walk four or five blocks into that traffic jam to get on a bus he, a bus he knew couldn't go anyplace. Mm-hmm. Then you have the story of William Whaley, the cab driver, who gave three different destinations to which he drove Oswald. Uh, the 500 block of Beckley, the 700 block of Beckley, and the intersection of two streets that don't intersect. When Oswald lived in the 1000 block, none of this makes any sense. Mm-hmm. And then you have the woman who ran the boarding house uh, swearing that she saw Oswald waiting to catch a bus uh, that went in the opposite direction from the one he was supposedly walking in, but does loop around and go back down there. And that was never investigated. Mm-hmm. Now, all they did was ignore everything that was inconsistent with what they wanted to say. Mm-hmm. Robert Lampell doesn't put any stock in uh, the number of witnesses who uh, supposedly had died in a short space of time following, uh, material witnesses following uh, the assassination. Do you place any stock in the... I agree with Bob entirely. There was a time when I was impressed by this, but by the time the list got to be close to 100, I, I suddenly saw that there was nothing to it. Let me give you an example. The cab driver, William Whaley, uh, was the first cab driver to drive to die while driving a cab in Dallas for something more than 30 years. And that was, it was allegedly a mysterious step. Now, let me tell you how he died. There was an 80-year-old man driving the wrong way on a divided highway, and there was a head-on collision. Now, I don't think any of these spookeries have 80-year-old kamikazes. <laughs> and besides that, there was nothing Whaley really could have done to destroy the official story that he hadn't already done when he was alive. Yeah. I just gave you one example in his account of where he drove Oswald. Okay, uh, also, we, we got an, uh, an account from Raphael about uh, the policeman running up the grass and all and being, uh, accosting someone there who claimed he was a secret service agent. Could you, in your own words, uh, describe how that happened and where it took place? in your book also that the chief of police, I think it was, was in the first car and says can direct people up to the uh, railroad tracks and uh, over by the knoll? Yeah. And then d- does he later recant that or says nothing about it? I beg your pardon? Does he recant on that or does he just say nothing about it? No, as a matter of fact, when he died, he was satisfied that the, that the crime was a conspiracy. So was the district attorney down there who's still alive. Okay, let's go to line one. Noah Griffin, you're on KGO's Hill Good morning. Hello. Hello. I don't know what you're talking about, but can you tell me why it has never been brought out that this Is that possible to happen, Harold? 
So it's possible that there was a later reenactment that this woman is remembering. But one of the problems that existed with the murder case in Dallas is that there were no arrangements uh, that are usual. I'm not suggesting this is conspiratorial. It isn't. But it's not unusual to have a, a press car or a press truck in advance and in the course of a motorcade where the cameramen are. But in this case, they just didn't have it. There was no cameraman closer than the six, I think the six car. And then most of them were on, a, on a, one or two buses that followed that. There was a pool of photographers in the six car, both still in motion picture, and they couldn't have photographed the motorcade. They didn't take still, they didn't take motion pictures, but at the, at the scene of the crime, all of a sudden, a couple of pictures were taken. Who arranged the route of the motorcade? Uh, that was done initially in Dallas by the host committee, but it, it was uh, altered and approved by the Secret Service with security interest in mind. It is the normal route of a motorcade through Dallas. Okay, Harold, can you hang on for just a bit? We're going to do a couple more spots. Okay, and we'll be right back with you. So hang on, please. Put you on hold here. And then we'll talk with Tom Hunter and find out what he's going to be talking about a little later on this morning. If you've ever had to stand on a day, you need to be said here. Um, a few more questions. Uh, Jay, Jay has one more of you, Harold. So uh, before you get any questions, sure. can you please bear with me for a minute? I'd like to do two things. First, remember before I spoke about people in your area who knew Oswald and the Marines. Right. I'd like very much to hear from anybody, including the man who called me in 66. And I'd like to say again that if you just write to me at Harold Weisberg, Route 12, Frederick, Maryland, it will reach me. Second of all, we've been talking about a really a dismal, bleak thing. And I'd like to give it a little bit of perspective. All right. Now, there's no way of justifying what the government did to do. But at the same time, I think we have to examine this in a different way. And I'd briefly like to suggest how this should be done. One, I'd like your audience to ask itself a question. For all of these the terrible things, is there another country in the world that he or she can think of in which I could have done what I've done, sue the government, make it give me perhaps a half million pages of records that were once secret so I can make them available to others? Uh, in Britain, they have an official secrets act. I would have gone to jail for it. In Canada, in Australia, this would have happened. In Russia, if I hadn't been killed, I'd have been put in a saint asylum. So, for all of its failings, and for all of the things we have to try and keep from happening again, we still have more freedom than almost anybody else. And for all of its abuses, I think we still have the closest thing to the best system of self-government man has ever devised. But people have to try and make the system work. Uh, every administration has a vested interest in secrecy. Uh, it's, it's not this administration in particular. It's not previous administrations in particular. It's going to be future administrations. But I think to put this in perspective, uh, if, this, if, if the assassination had happened in any other country, the people would know less about it than they know in the United States. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to give a, a little bit of perspective to it. Uh, Bottom line on this, do you, do you, I know I asked you this the first question when you when you came on with us. Do you, do you still have any theory about who killed JFK that you feel comfortable with, even espousing as a theory? No, but I can take it one step farther. All right. I can say that the official evidence itself leaves it beyond question. First, that there was a conspiracy to kill the president, and second, that all official bodies knew it and lied about it. Knew about it in advance. Pardon me? Knew about it in advance. Not in advance. No, no after advance. the fact. The evidence is, is unequivocal. The crime was beyond the capability of any one man, whether or not Oswald. Therefore, there was a conspiracy. And everybody knew it. I give one indication of how the FBI and the Secret Service covered it up by ignoring the third shot, the one, uh, by ignoring the shot that missed and wounded Jim Tegg. Uh, I give another indication the FBI the day of the assassination assassination, even before Oswald was charged with the crime, decided they wouldn't look at any other suspects. And that, again, autom automatically ruled out any question of conspiracy. So, there were serious, serious mistakes. Harold, you, you've just been beautiful in, in giving us this time. I want to talk with you during the week, and we'll do this again real soon. Fine, glad to. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Harold Weisberg. Now, you make a decision, folks, as to what you think uh, happened here. Here are two tapes of Oswald, and uh, we're going to play them for you very, very quickly, Oswald and his arrest.
I decided. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. This is KGO Radio in San Francisco, AM 81. It's 6 AM. <laughs>